Okay, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome you here to the first ever White House Summit on Building Climate Resilient Communities. My name is Hannah Safford. I'm a senior policy advisor with the White House Climate Policy Office. Um, I lead our resilience portfolio for the climate team, but have been really delighted to work with um, folks from across federal government, um, across the White House, and um, really across the stakeholder community to have this event here today. Um, we have, it's a small room, but we have representatives of more than 25 states, territories, and tribal nations here with us in person, um, as well as I know we have many more who are tuning in online. Um, we have a great speaking program lined up today. Uh, that speaking program is gonna run until approximately 2.15. Um, then for those of you who are in the room, you'll move to uh, roundtable discussions. For those of you who are tuning in online, um, there'll be a 15 minute break and then we will be live streaming one of the roundtable discussions. So come right back at 2.30 and the roundtable discussion moderated by senior advisor John Podesta is going to run until 3.15. Um, so, so do stay tuned after that speaking program concludes. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ali Zaidi, um, my boss and the President's National Climate Advisor, who's going to formally kick off today's speaking program. Ali. All right. Thank you, Hannah, uh, for that introduction and for all that you've done to help bring this incredible group together. Um, for those on the live stream, you don't see what I see, which is a... Uh, diverse group from all across America. We've got, I think, a fire chief here. Um, we've definitely got an admiral in the house. Uh, we've got uh, folks really representing the broad um, set of stakeholders um, who not only are responding to the climate crisis as it shows up in the form of extreme disasters in your communities, um, but helping do the important work uh, to both build back better um, and also prepare uh, our communities uh, to be stronger in the face of uh, the changes that we've already unleashed in our environment. Um, it's so often, uh, I think, the way we tell the story of the climate crisis um, uh, that instills this sense of doom and despair um, across the country, across the world. Um, we've seen the skies turn orange. Um, we've breathed in the smoke into our lungs from fires burning hundreds of miles away. Uh, we've seen our friends and family members, uh, property and memories washed away uh, by floods that are unprecedented by every measure. We've seen our coastlines become greater vectors of risk. So for good reason, uh, I think people are horrified uh, by the catastrophe uh, the emergency, um, the fury of a changing climate. But I think what this room represents uh, is the proposition that we don't have to write this chapter of our history as a story of doom and despair. This chapter of our history we can write as a moment of rebirth and repair, of revitalization, of coming together, of the incredible power we have when we put our minds to the task and that's the sense of hope and possibilities uh, that I'd like for us to carry through the discourse and dialogue today to figure out how we can find each other on the other side of the table, how we can align along a common framework and a roadmap for accelerated action, how we as a federal government can be a better partner to you. Um, this framework uh, and this convening was an idea over the summer. Um, and I remember we were flying uh, to California with the president um, to talk about uh, the incredible impacts that we were seeing out west. And this is on the flight there, uh, president was very clear. This cannot be an exercise of rhetoric. Uh, this has to be an exercise uh, measured in action. And I think by every measure, uh, what we've seen over the last two and a half years as your partners uh, is you lead the way with action. Um, resilience is not an abstract concept for you. Uh, we can measure it in the acres of forest that you have managed um, today. Uh, just uh, two and a half years into this administration, we've been able to working with you um, reduce fire risk 
over a million acres of forest across the West, which means there's going to be less fuel when the next fire shows up. They will burn with fewer uh, resources available to them. Um, when you think about what we've done in terms of the physical infrastructure, thanks to the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we now have over $50 billion flowing to communities. But let's be real. I, my job is to talk our book. But the reality is the $50 billion are there, but they need to be implemented. They need to be implemented in a way that is people-centered and justice-centered equity-centered that reflects all of our values, that gets metabolized for greatest impact uh, across the country. So part of what we're talking about here is not just a celebration of all that we've done, but how much uh, we have yet to do in terms of implementation. Um, today, uh, in addition to all the stuff we're talking about here this morning, um, we announced uh, a new effort to push forward further on building codes. That's another example of something that's not super sexy, unless you're like Zab Briggs. <laughs> uh, but, but it's something that makes a massive difference. Uh, it makes a massive difference in the real lives of real people. And think about what you've been doing what your work has been doing in terms of changing the political economy of bold action. In Louisiana, industry came together with the, private, with the public sector. Democrats came together with Republicans to pass an update to building codes, not just to boost energy, but to boost resilience. So we can find, I think, allies everywhere we look if we show up with an openness and a willingness to engage. Um, today's conversation, I think, kicks us off in the right direction. And, and you know, maybe the last note I'll leave, leave off on is, it's our role as a federal government to have a national framework. It's our goal as a federal government to mount an all of government and all of society response to the climate crisis. It's our role to figure out how we tackle the root cause of climate change, the emissions that we're putting into the sky. It's our role to be your partners, show up not to create patchworks of solutions, but to try to harmonize across the nation. It's our role to show up with resources. But today's convening, if anything, stands for the proposition that we will have community-level solutions, community-designed, community-driven, community-delivered, that you are the front lines of that. And who better to talk about what that means and what this partnership should look like uh, than um, a mayor who I think has really blazed this trail. Uh, mayor Rhodes Conway, welcome to the stage and kick us off. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. My name is Satya Rhodes Conway. I have the honor of being the mayor of Madison, Wisconsin, and the current chair of Climate Mayors. Um, and I just want to start by saying thank you, all of you, for the work that you're doing in your places, um, and thank you for being here to share that work. We know that climate change is the defining challenge of our time. And we have to focus on mitigation, but also on adaptation, and that's what I think today is really about. We have to build and rebuild infrastructure and the built environment to be resilient to our changing climate and to climate disasters. That is a big task. And as if that were not enough, we have to do that with local expertise, with federal funding, um, with this smarts and innovation from academia and NGOs with full support from the private sector and while centering equity and environmental justice. I want to talk a little bit about a few of those things, uh, but I think it's really important for us to think about resilience as something that we are rebuilding, right? And that we, as we look at our infrastructure, at our built environment, at our community resources, and we are building resilience into every single one of those things. In the city of Madison, and I think in cities across the country, we are so grateful for the Biden-Harris administration's dedication to centering climate investments 
and of course for holding the summit today. Um, this framework around resilience, I think, I hope, sparks a national conversation um, and lets people find themselves in the work that this administration is doing uh, and in partnership. And I just have to say that the whole of government approach to climate that this administration is taking is both unprecedented and so very welcome. Um, it, I am grateful every day for the president's leadership around climate. It, you know, mayors have been working on climate for a long time, um, uh, even when other people were not. Uh, cities and, and local governments and local communities were doing the work. Um, and of course, in our local communities, we experience both the disasters and the everyday stressors. Might be the little things, like responding to buckling pavement on hot days during the summer, or an increased demand at our pools and splash pads. Or it might be the big things, like sea level rise and extreme weather risks and how well our communities are prepared to deal with prolonged heat and wildfires and hurricanes and floods. You all know the crises that our communities face. In the city of Madison, we've been working hard. We're at about 75% renewable energy for our local uh, use, our, our government use. We're electrifying our fleet and using biodiesel for our big equipment. We don't build a building if it's not LEED certified. I mean, we're doing a lot of work and we've achieved many climate wins, but despite our successes, our residents still face the impacts of a changing climate every day. Earlier this year, Madison, like many cities across the country, was impacted by the Canadian wildfires, um, which exacerbated the worsening conditions, uh, which were exacerbated by the worsening conditions of the climate crisis. I'm going to be frank with you all. We weren't prepared. We didn't have a plan around that kind of air quality incident. We didn't know what to do. Now, we figured it out because you know what? We're local government and when other people maybe can just think they can take a break and shut down government, local government doesn't get to do that. <laughs> but we know that as climate disasters become more frequent, we are going to need more resilience planning. We are going to need, and we, now we're beginning to develop that, but we were scrambling for a couple of days there. And so anything that helps local government build resilience plans, think about what to do when you have an air quality emergency or when you have a heat emergency or when you have a flood is important. And I'm so grateful that the Biden administration is thinking about that for local governments. We have got to protect our residents from the events that compromise air quality and public health outcomes. And we also have to mitigate the adverse economic impacts that happen during these events for our local businesses. Madison is also facing more extreme storm events as a result of climate change. And in 2018, we saw catastrophic flooding well above the thousand year storm levels uh, as a result of climate change. People lost their lives, their homes, their property. Um, and since then, we have been mapping every inch of our watershed and making lists of projects. And I, it is in the tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to be prepared for future flooding. And that's part of why I'm so grateful to the Biden administration for the infrastructure bill, because that represents resources that our community can use to become more resilient in the future, to build back our infrastructure, but to build it back better and more resilient and more adaptive. And like many cities, we're facing hotter summers. We're looking to increase our urban tree canopy. We're looking to nature-based solutions to stave off urban heat island effects. And we're hopeful that the bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act money can be used for these priorities. Keeping residents safe is the top priority of local government, and that means that we have to keep them safe from impacts of climate change as well. Mayors are working all across the country to do this, and whatever it might be, whether it's cooling centers in Phoenix or habitat restoration in New Orleans, tree canopy expansion in Seattle and Detroit, community resilience hubs in LA and Cambridge. I have seen climate mayors my colleagues do this work all across the country to keep their communities safe. And we know that there's no time to lose. 
we have got to do the work to protect our communities and our residents. And we've got to do that work through a lens of climate justice. We have got to think about who is hurt first and worst by climate change and center environmental justice in the work that we're doing. We have to look for multiple wins for our residents so that whatever climate solutions we're developing are going to benefit our community with jobs just to begin with, with economic investment, um, with workforce training. And again, I'm thankful to the Biden administration because they get that. And the money that they've rolled out has money for workforce training in it and is focused on environmental justice. And that is so refreshing and welcome. And again, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Um, we know that this work can create good, green, family-supporting jobs and to help build the middle class. And I am eager to make that happen in my community and across the country. And of course, we can't do it alone, right? That's part of the beauty of today. All of you come from a variety of sectors, and we know we all have to work together. I'm grateful for the partnership of the federal government, but I'm also grateful for the partnerships that we have in academia and in the private sector and with NGOs, because it is going to take all of us to put together the solutions, to scale them, and to spread them across the country. So I'm here to say we need all hands on deck, and we need everybody to be thinking both about mitigation and about adaptation. It's going to take collaboration with universities, cities, healthcare, NGOs, community-based organizations, business, investors, and much, much more. Bringing ideas from ideation to research, testing, experimenting, commercializing, implementing, all along that spectrum, we need folks pulling uh, to do this work. Right now, we have an unprecedented opportunity to help our communities respond to climate change thanks to President Biden's historic climate investments. I am so grateful to have an administration in the White House that understands the urgency of climate change and is prioritizing both mitigation and adaptation and resilience. I want to thank the President and the Vice President for their leadership on this. Again, I want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing, and I am so excited to be in conversation with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, we're going to transition to the next portion of our speaking program. This is going to be a, a spotlight section. Um, so we have three distinguished speakers, um, Secretary of the Interior Holland, uh, Chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Shelley Lowe, and Homeland Security Advisor Liz Sherwood Randall, who are each going to spotlight um, an impactful community-driven project that's being carried out in partnership with federal government. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Secretary Holland, who is um, hopefully joining us on Zoom. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you for kicking us off. And hello, everyone. I'm very grateful to join you virtually alongside my colleagues from across the Biden-Harris administration. Everyone here today understands these simple truths. The climate crisis is real, it's happening now, and it's uprooting lives across our country. As we look to stem the worsening impacts of the climate crisis, we know that clean energy will help communities across the country be part of the climate solution while creating good paying jobs. At Interior, we are proud to lead the efforts to deliver on the president's goals of a clean energy future, both offshore and on our public lands. But it is also abundantly clear that even as we transition our economy toward a sustainable future, Adaptation and resilience must be core pillars of our collective climate response. As our country adapts to a changing climate, the department is heeding President Biden's call to do more and leverage every resource at our disposal. And that's why today we are announcing two significant developments to the department's climate and sustainability strategy. Last year, I issued a secretary's order to phase out the sale of single-use plastics on interior managed lands by 2032. Today, we are telling you how we're going to get it done. 
New plans from each of our bureaus outline specific approaches and schedules to both phase out single use plastic products such as plastic bottles and bags and to implement improvements like the installation of water bottle filling stations across interior managed lands. Our department is also taking a concerted look at how we operate and make decisions about the future in the face of the climate crisis. Because let's be honest, it should be part of every decision we make, right? Today, we're announcing the first ever effort to factor the climate crisis into all operations at the department. Four new department manual policies will strengthen and enhance mission critical decisions and activities. These strengthened policies reflect our strong commitment to using science, indigenous knowledge, and landscape scale management as the foundation for departmental decisions. As our public lands face more intense wildfires, drought, storms, and other extreme weather events, improving the department's climate-informed decision-making is critical to ensuring effective and efficient resource management while also protecting communities and wildlife. Climate change is the crisis of our lifetimes. Addressing it demands our full attention and requires us to move intentionally and quickly toward our adaptation and resilience goals so that communities and ecosystems are prepared for climate fueled changes now and into the future. The Department of the Interior is doing just that with projects across the country, made possible by President Biden's Investing in America agenda. These are two case studies I want to share with you. First, across Northeastern North Carolina, our department is working with partners and local officials to advance transformational peatland restoration work. Healthy forested peatlands offer some of nature's best carbon storage while protecting coastal communities from threats like sea level rise, flooding, and wildfires. But extreme climate fueled conditions combined with increased wildfire risk threaten these essential ecosystems and the communities and wildlife that depend on them. With over $27 million from the Inflation Reduction Act, the department is advancing nature-based solutions like peatland restoration across North Carolina's Albemarle Pamlico Estuary to fortify local communities against the mounting impacts of climate change. Already, the Fish and Wildlife Service and its partners have restored 37,000 acres of peatland at Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, over half of the project's goal. By restoring the natural hydrology of regional peat soils, the department is ensuring that communities and local habitats can enjoy the region's countless ecological services from clean air and water and soil to storm flow resilience long into the future. A second case study is grounded in our relationship with sovereign tribal nations. Across the Western United States, the department is leveraging the President's Investing in America agenda funding to implement long overdue water infrastructure for a drought resilient future. Earlier this year, I visited the Gila River Indian community. Tribal leaders shared how dire the drought conditions are made worse by climate impacts. Now with a more than $200 million investment, the community will not only increase water conservation and improve water efficiency to advance the tribe's water resilience, but system savings will put two feet of water back into Lake Mead, benefiting the entire Colorado River system and the communities that depend on it. I am proud of the progress our administration has made to foster climate resilience across our country. Together with historic funding, we are preparing our communities for climate change today and for generations to come. Thank you all again so much and I'll now pass the mic back to Hannah. Thank you so much, Secretary. Um, and now we'll just go ahead and welcome up Chair Lowe. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Well, yet a she shall a low in a share, Belagana Nishlin, Anastasia Tachini Bashachi, Belagana Dashate, or Taba Dashanella, Lo Cantiel de Nasha, the Washington de Chagan. My name is Shelley Lowe, I'm Navajo, I am originally from Ganado, Arizona, and I'm chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is such a pleasure to be in this room and to be having this conversation with all of you today. And I'm so delighted to be able to spotlight some of the work NEH is doing to foster climate resilience across the country. A few, well, last month, I was at the National Book Festival and I was in conversation with Joy Harjo, um, the U former US Poet Laureate and a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. And she said something in our discussion that stayed with me. She said, what connects Native people is we think of the world as a living thing. We're not separate from it. When, we, when you see someone or something as a living being, the relationship changes. And I think that is very critical. How we talk about the climate, how we talk about our surroundings, makes all the difference. What would happen if we saw the Earth as a living being? How would our relationship to Earth change? As you may know, NEH is the only federal agency dedicated to funding the humanities, which include history, philosophy, literature, language, ethics, law, archaeology, political theory, comparative religion, anthropology, sociology, and media and cultural studies. You didn't know that was all humanities, did you? <laughs> to date, NEH has awarded nearly $6 billion in grant funding to colleges and universities, museums, libraries, historic sites, cultural centers, public television and radio stations, and individual researchers. Building on this legacy, the Biden-Harris administration has developed a new climate strategy at NEH that incorporates resiliency and sustainability in the nation's cultural and educational sectors and promotes basic humanities research and development into the historic roots and cultural effects of climate change. Last month, NEH announced the first round of awards made under two new grant programs, the Climate Smart Humanities Organizations Program and the Cultural and Community Resilience Program that focused on, the, both of these programs focus on climate resilience and were created under the, new agen the agency's new American Tapestry Weaving Together Past, Present, and Future Initiative, which leverages the humanities to strengthen our democracy, advance equity for all, and address our changing climate. As energy costs rise and natural disasters become more frequent, museums, libraries, archives, historic sites, and colleges and universities face enormous tasks. To anticipate operational, physical, and financial impacts of climate-related events on their institutions, while also reducing their own impact on the environment. NEH's new Climate Smart Humanities Organizations program supports these efforts by offering federal matching funds for comprehensive organizational assessments that lead to strategic climate action and adaptation plans. Recent NEH awards support uh, a comprehensive energy and carbon audit at the Anchorage Museum and the development of a climate heritage plan to protect San Antonio's historic buildings and neighborhoods, including five colonial Spanish missions that are designated UNESCO World Heritage Sites. NEH's new cultural and community resilience program supports efforts to mitigate the impacts of climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic on communities while safeguarding their cultural resources especially among historically disadvantaged communities, as outlined in the Biden-Harris administration's Justice 40 initiative. Recent awards in this category include support for the University of Puerto Rico Calle to expand an oral history collection about community responses to climate change in Puerto Rico, as well as support for the Harrison County, Mississippi library system to collect and preserve oral histories and historical materials from six communities at risk of hurricane flooding along the Gulf Coast. With each of these programs, we're saving what would otherwise be lost. We're saving America's stories. Today, I'm excited to announce NEH's new Pacific Islands Cultural Initiative, a major agency initiative that will strengthen the cultural and educational sectors of America Samoa, Guam, or Guahan, Hawaii, and the Northern Marianas which face unique challenges due to their geography, as well as the historic underinvestment in the region by the federal government. 
The initiative will prioritize support for programming that embeds climate resilience, native and indigenous language and cultural revitalization, and the elevation of Pacific Islander voices. Also, it is, as it is Anapeasy Week, I am pleased to say the initiative will support research and curriculum development in the humanities at K through 12 and higher education institutions across the region. NEH is announcing $1.3 million in its first round of funding to support its strategic partners in the region, including through the creation of a regional cultural network to deepen our support for the Pacific. I'm pleased that we are joined today by NEH's leading partner in the Northern Marianas, Leo Pangalinen, who flew over 30 hours and will be uh, participating in a roundtable um, this afternoon. Included in this funding is $500,000 in emergency relief funding to support cultural and educational institutions affected by the 2023 wildfires in Maui and Typhoon Mawar in Guahan. These funds will provide for the preservation and conservation of impacted cultural resources in Hawaii and Guahan, as well as efforts to safeguard heritage sites, historical artifacts, and cultural landmarks. Funds will also support local initiatives aimed at documenting and preserving the cultural heritage of affected communities and build capacity through cultural heritage disaster preparedness, training, and resources. Our strategic partners in Guahan told us they are excited to, and I quote, foster a culture of knowledge sharing which elevates Pacific Islander voices through an extensive digitization and archival project. And America Samoa, our Humanities Council partners, will add to their collection of children's literature to help preserve and sustain the Samoan language as well as, as, well as its culture and community values. In Joy Harjo's Eagle poem, she conjures up a world where we're all connected. She writes, to pray, you open your whole self, to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. We must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. We pray that it will be done in beauty, in beauty. I hope that you will carry Joy's message forward, and I hope that you will open yourselves up to sky, to earth, to sun. The world, after all, is a living, breathing being, and it is up to us to save it in beauty. Thank you. I will now turn it over to U.S. Homeland Security Advisor, Liz Sherwood Randall. That was so beautiful. We, we, we took our breath away listening to you in beauty. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am Liz Sherwood Randall. I'm the President's Homeland Security Advisor. And I want to welcome you to the first ever White House Summit on Building Climate Resist Resilient Communities. I want to recognize uh, my colleague, Ali Zaidi, although maybe he has had to leave briefly. I don't see him here now and uh, Secretary Deb Holland, who joined us, and of course, um, our Chair Shelley Lowe, who spoke so beautifully and eloquently. Thank you for your leadership and uh, for the opportunity to participate today. It's an honor to speak alongside everybody, and I know you have an extraordinary program ahead. In my role here at the White House, I am confronted daily by the impacts of climate change on our communities across the nation. This began literally with the first weeks in office where we faced an extraordinary, unprecedented ice storm in Texas uh, that knocked out power for much of the state, caused huge disruption uh, to the lives and livelihoods of many of the people of Texas. And we saw so early in that storm how hard it was for people to access the help that we wanted to get to them quickly in light of what they were facing. And we have been focused ever since then on building and strengthening community resilience in two significant ways. The first is by helping communities to better withstand the impacts of the range of climate threats that are now part of our daily lives by prioritizing investments to harden the physical infrastructure 
in these communities, and especially the critical infrastructure that our communities depend on. Thanks to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we now have unprecedented resources available to do just that. For example, through FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, better known as BRIC, Santa Rosa County in Florida has recently received funding to elevate six single-family homes that had previously been flooded over 20 times, raising them above the historic flood lines and making them more resilient to future flooding. And the city of Key West recently received funding to build a shelter for first responders who need to stay behind when everyone else is evacuated so they can continue to support the community during hurricane events. And we have examples of these projects all over the country and in every state. Through the Department of Energy, we are making strategic investments to harden our power grid, which is critical to support first responders, hospitals, and the basic needs of people when a climate-fueled extreme weather event upends their lives. For example, as the President recently announced, we're helping Hawaii to rebuild and strengthen its grid to better withstand future fires and other severe weather-related events, both in Maui after the devastating impact of the recent wildfires and throughout the state's islands. In Puerto Rico, we are supporting the resilient rebuilding of their power grid and investing in distributed generation and storage systems to help the most vulnerable Puerto Rican families keep the lights on through power outages. And you will hear later, I think, from Mitch Landrieu, my colleague who's led our infrastructure investments, about the whole range of projects that we have invested in, where we focus specifically on the importance of engineering in that resilience, both cyber resilience and physical resilience that is essential for our communities in the future. This brings me to the second dimension of resilience, which is that we need to do better at ensuring communities have the capacity to respond and recover and rebuild more quickly when a disaster hits them and when it is too large and overwhelms even the most capable and resilient communities. Some states like California and New York have experienced and well-resourced disaster response and recovery capabilities but other states do not, meaning that they have much less capacity to prepare for, respond to, recover, and rebuild when a disaster strikes. And we have seen that disparity throughout our nearly three years of work together in this administration. So we are working to increase training and strengthening of capacity for vulnerable states and communities before disaster happens so that they can recover more effectively. One way we are doing this is through FEMA's Emergency Management Performance Grant Program, which provides state, local, tribal, and territorial emergency management agencies with resources to prepare ahead of disasters. Another way we are helping communities is by providing direct technical assistance to support communities in developing their own climate risk assessments and mitigation and climate adaptation plans. I want to emphasize if that you are from a community or state and you're not aware of these programs, you have in each state a representative uh, from the Department of Homeland Security focused on these issues. You also have your own emergency response organizations. And you should get in touch with them to ask about access to these programs because they're designed to help you. I want to close by reemphasizing the priority that President Biden has placed on how we can all do this work better together. He has traveled to many communities in many of your states, and he's heard firsthand from survivors about the long and often very bumpy road that you face when beginning to rebuild in the wake of a disaster, from wildfires and burn scars to severe flooding and hurricanes. He has charged us to do more and to think about how we can help communities rebuild not only faster, but also in a way that leaves them better and specifically more resilient for the future. Our mandate from him is simple. When disasters strike and your home or your town is destroyed, you should be able to count on your government to be there for you for as long as it takes. That's what he expects us to do. 
at his direction, our team here at the National Security Council has been leading a cabinet-wide effort to re-envision how we support long-term community building and resilience, to both reduce bureaucracy and to coordinate sustained and effective support after the immediate response has been completed and that long and sometimes bumpy road to recovery begins. I know these topics will be discussed in much greater detail during the roundtable sessions later in the program, and I just want to say how much your insights and expertise will benefit us as we seek to raise our game in support of your efforts in your communities around the country. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And I have now the distinct honor of introducing our panel, so I'll call our panelists to come to the stage. So as, as we all know, it takes top-down action to drive a more resilient community, um, but it also takes uh, action to be driven from the ground up. So I'm very delighted um, to have a panel of esteemed experts in the field. Um, I'm also delighted to introduce our moderator, my boss, fearless leader, the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, Chair Brenda Mallory, um, and our esteemed panelists that include Marissa Ajo, who is the climate director for the executive office, uh, climate office of King County. Uh, she's also been chief resilience officer for Houston, Los Angeles, and Washington State. Also, Dr. Atia Martin, who is the founder of the Black Resilience Network and CEO of founder of All Aces Incorporated. Dr. Martin and her team partner with businesses, nonprofits, government on organizational, professional, and personal development that advances racial justice and build resilience. And then last but not least, Gerilyn Lopez is a member of the White Earth Tribe and works as a weatherization auditor and inspector. Um, at a nonprofit community action agency serving low-income families over five, in over five counties in northwestern and west central Minnesota. So without further ado, do, do, I'll turn it to the panel. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, and thank you for the kickoff. I think it was, it's been a wonderful hour or so just hearing from different people with the enthusiasm and direct experience that is so important and so much a part of what this conversation is going to be. I'm so thrilled to see how full this room is, a lot of familiar faces uh, in the room, and a lot of people who have been working in the, the trenches uh, on these issues for a long time. So um, I'm delighted that you're here, but I'm also particularly delighted to have the, the pleasure of actually uh, participating in a discussion with these leaders, uh, all, all of whom have tremendous experience and who are going to share and give us some insights on how we can do a better job to actually support the work that's going on all across the country and, uh, and make sure that we are serving the American people in the way that they need. Um, we have a tremendous challenge, as Ali pointed out, but we also, I loved his notion of let's lean into the hope because I think that uh, so much expresses what I think we think of as the opportunity that we have at this moment. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for all of you being willing to participate in that. Um, our, our panel is called uh, Building Climate Resilience from the Ground Up. Uh, and that was not accidentally chosen. I think we recognize where the strength in a lot of these resilience efforts uh, is, and we really wanna make sure that we're both supporting but lifting up the great work that's already happening and helping to scale it up. That scaling up part is really important. So um, we've got great people who can help us really understand the unique strengths uh, of in particular communities, but also, um, uh, the needs in communities that, that we may not be as privy to or the complications that people are facing and uh, just really look forward to having this great panel to share with us. So um, without further ado, uh, let me start. Um, my first round is just going to be question individual questions to each of our panelists that sort of uh, tease off of their experience. And I'm going to begin uh, with Dr. Martin. So for framing. Uh, the president announced the development of the National Climate Resilience Framework and today's summit when he was in California. We heard reference to that earlier. Um, at that event, he spoke about the importance of bringing together stakeholders from all communities to ensure progress on, re on climate resilience. Uh, Dr. Martin, as founder of the Black Resilience Network, 
What role do you see your organization playing in the implementation of some of the recommendations uh, laid out in the National Climate Resilience Framework? And what opportunities for action do you view as priorities for your members? Microphone check. There we go. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay. So first of all, happy Thursday, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for your facilitation. Thank you for the question. And so for the Black Resilience Network, for context, we are uh, a network of organizations. We're kind of a network of networks um, connected to folks on the ground in communities, uh, particularly black communities. And so this idea of the uh, climate resilience framework is really exciting because it reinforces many of the things that our members have been advocating for in their communities. Now, the opportunity I see is uh, the ability to make sure that the investments that come out of all of the related um, uh, uh, funding um, is really available to community-based organizations, um, that rural, towns, particularly unincorporated towns, are able to get the support they need to access. For those who might not be familiar, in some rural towns you have one person who's like the everything person. Like they do everything, uh, include run the town. Right? So our ability to help make sure that folks can access the resource is going to be critical um, for the implementation. And I think um, uh, Black Resilience Network members are going to continue to collaborate with each other to do what we can with what we have, but we're also looking forward to collaborating um, on uh, the, at the different levels of government that folks are working at. And here's where I'll land, because we have two minutes each. I read the email. Um, <laughs> and that is... Um, this idea of uh, making sure we are collaborating uh, to apply for different funding sources to kind of work through the system, even though, uh, even as it is a challenge for folks to access resources, um, that we're again doing what we can with what we have and making sure that on the disaster management side of the house, and we'll come to that later, um, that on that recovery side that we're bringing in climate action. Um, for communities um, who are already disproportionately burdened by the impacts of climate change. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> there's, they have these controlled. Um, so first of all, I just want to just lift up your referencing the, the fact that we have these communities where one person does everything. I mean, that is a reality that I think many across the country just aren't even aware of. So then when we talk about the uh, opportunities that we have, people aren't necessarily realizing what it will mean for that community. So thank you for lifting that right up. Um, all right, let me uh, go to the second question, which is gonna go to Ms. Aho. Uh, one of the overarching themes in the framework is locally driven, community led, and federally supported. You have led resilience efforts at many different levels in Houston, in Los Angeles, and in the state of Washington. So how can we connect our resilience efforts across the different levels of government and across various disciplines? And how can the federal government do a better job to meet the community needs on the ground? Thank you very much for that question and for the opportunity to be here. Is the mic on? Yep. Great. <laughs> then um, I, I would like to let you all into my head for a quick minute here and then I'll answer the question. And so for my first days as serving as a resilience practitioner, I thought about resilience by scale. I thought about it by individuals and people first and that's in the framework, it's great to see. I thought about it by neighborhoods, recognizing each neighborhood has different challenges. I thought about it by watersheds, nature's boundary, when the politics is you know, not aligned with nature, we, um, we have some work to do. Um, and then really looking at municipalities and their role to, to lead by example and to support others, um, states, regions, and, and beyond. And so I've had the honor to serve a, a number of those scales, but um, no matter where I'm at, I'm always looking at the other scales. And I'm always trying to think about how we're addressing each of those scales, because if one scale isn't building resilience, then we'll fail uh, when there is a, a test to that resilience. So um, my recommendations for how to have governments at any size or scale, even offices of one, 
uh, to sort of organize is around uh, first collaborating. We can't do it alone. We've got to bring everybody to the table, even folks that uh, you don't think of at the table, bring them to the table because the urgency is there, um, the, the support is, is here, and being able to not go it alone. Um, and then really looking at roles and responsibilities, recognizing that some folks have capacity, some folks don't. Some folks have staff, some, some folks don't. Some folks have good procurement programs, some folks don't. Um, and so how do you look at what, what each person or each entity can bring so that we're getting the dollars to the ground, uh, to the boots on the ground, to the frontline communities as quickly as we possibly can, and we're serving the needs of the folks who are closest to the challenges um, first. And then third is really around looking at this climate emergency as a climate emergency. There are a lot of tools in our toolbox that some communities are more familiar with that we open up when there is an emergency. And there are different sort of status quo tool. There's a toolbox for the status quo. And I would argue that we really need to open that emergency toolbox, look at the things that we do when there is a threat, change the way that the systems are working so that they are more outcome driven and less process driven sometimes so that we can get the solutions uh, working on the ground faster. Uh, and the federal government can of course encourage and reward folks who are doing that. Excellent, thank you so much. And in particular, lifting up that uh, the importance of that collaboration. I think that one of the things that we're definitely hopeful that this meeting and meetings like this uh, really achieve is to open up some lines of communications that may not already be there. I mean, one of the things you see when you actually go on the ground is that a lot of times people are working very well together, but sometimes our being there actually brings people together in ways that you may, we may not have anticipated. So I think that's a really important feature. All right, um, moving on to our third question to Ms. Lopez. And again, the president often has said that when he thinks of climate, he thinks of jobs and innovation. Uh, and of a turning, uh, and of turning peril into progress. So him. Um, you are um, someone who has an interesting background uh, and has been working directly with people day to day, helping to safeguard their homes against extreme weather and to make um, them more uh, energy efficient. Could you talk a little bit about your work now and your work with AmeriCorps uh, and what you see um, as on the ground needs? Um, well, I started out, it was in my early 20s when I took trainings provided by my tribe, the White Earth Nation in Minnesota. I um, was able to take part in the weather, weather and wind power technologies that they were doing at that time. And then following that, I was able to gain job skills to serve with AmeriCorps. So, with the AmeriCorps Ampact Home Energy Initiative. During my AmeriCorps term, I served with Mojave Ottawa Community Action Partnership, where I was paired with an experienced weatherization auditor. He's, he's a great guy, a very good mentor. I learned on the job skills trainings that I needed to assist low income families and make their homes more safe and more energy efficient. Uh, in my current position, I know that I'm not only making a difference working, not making a difference working um, for the environment, but also for the families I assist day in, day out. What I wish that everyone could see is how this type of work has such a broad positive impact, impact on our country. Weatherization services lead to cost savings for residents uh, through both the weatherization and retrofit services that provide us well as an education component in the program, um, reducing strain on energy, energy production facilities and reduces the health and impacts from outdoor threats like extreme heat and cold during cold outings during uh, power outages, floodings and poor air quality conditions. Um, the skills and trainings that I experienced and received during my AmeriCorps service got my foot in the door in the weatherization industry and equip me with the skills I need 
to secure a current position as a weatherization auditor at Mojave, Ottawa. The immediate need for this situation is going to be providing hands-on training for those interested in clean, clean energy, which can also make homes more resilient during extreme weather events. So we, we need more people in our positions to come and see what we do and see how we can help these low-income homes and the people on our reservations for, for um, yeah, for the weather is community the actions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to point out, I, Ali may have said this earlier, um, last week the administration launched the uh, American Climate Corps, a workforce training program and service initiative that I think is designed to do exactly um, what Ms. Lopez was just saying about getting your foot in the door. And so we're very excited about that and what, what that might present. Um, all right, I want to move on with a, a question for uh, everyone. Um, Combating climate, uh, climate change requires an all-hands-on-deck approach. At today's summit, we have representatives from federal, state, municipal, local, and tribal governments, the private sector, and NGOs. What are some of the critical pieces of climate resilience, the climate resilience puzzle that you think this unique collection of voices can best help address uh, on this issue at the, at the community level? and identifying uh, pressing gaps and challenges inhibiting uh, kind of all-inclusive uh, solutions. So help me understand what you think some of our um, opportunities are here today. And I'll start again with, with Dr. Martin. Of course you start. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I still love you. Uh, so I wasn't ready for that question, <laughs> but um, I think this idea of how we are able to get money, again, into the hands of uh, community organizations and uh, uh, support folks to get access to resources is critical. And so in terms of where there are opportunities, I think philanthropy is gonna be key in that because we know that federal government, um, you know, I love federal government, and we also know that it takes time to, to change things in ways as we're learning what actually works to, to help uh, resources become more accessible. So with that context, it means that there are other resources that are gonna be needed to step up as we did during COVID-19 to be able to help uh, build out that, or let me reframe, reinforce the community leadership and capacity necessary. Um, because we do know that uh, community members and organizations are the architects of change. They're incredibly important partners. So when we think about context experts, the people who know the nuances of what's happening on the ground, who are closest to, to the experiences, um, we need their expertise from a perspective of the content or technical experts, right? We can't design solutions for communities. We can't do things to communities. We have to do it with them. And no, I know that's not easy, and I know that it takes a lot of work, but uh, I'll leave you with the quote, most people don't recognize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work, and it's just what it takes. Um, so, stop there. I love that. <laughs> Somebody, I hope, wrote that down because I want it in my next speech. Um, okay, uh, Ms. Aho. So where I think there's an opportunity that we often miss out on is uh, to do our storytelling better, both around climate risk and also around the opportunities and the joy that this work can bring. Um, and so there have been a few times um, in my experience where I've been able to work with artists who are wonderful storytellers, uh, sometimes better than government. Uh, and so while we were, sometimes, um, so when we were uh, putting together the resilience strategy in Houston with the community, um, we had a working group of over 100 folks, and there was an artist on the working group, and I had assigned them to our living with and without water uh, sort of sub-working group, and they had said, uh, I think you put me in the wrong group. And I said, no, I don't think I put you in the wrong group, but if you'd like to change groups, that's fine. But try and give this, give this a try. Um, and so they joined a group of predominantly engineers um, to talk about how we would live with and without water. 
and their questions and their encouragement of um, speaking more plainly and their ability to uh, sort of see the challenges differently made that a totally different conversation. And so there have been other times uh, where um, Houston actually got a grant through the EPA to uh, have artists work with community members to tell their story about the poor air quality that they have there. And so I think that tapping into and supporting the arts in the storytelling around climate is really one great opportunity. And there are, are a few examples of that happening, but there can be so much more. Thank you so much for that. I mean, one of the things I often say when people say, how can we help those on the outside is, I see the government does a miserable job at telling our story, help us tell our story. So I think that's a, a great idea. Um, Ms. Lopez? Well, we know our youth are passionate about playing a role to address climate change, and we need to make sure that we are being intentional about bringing their voices to the table and incorporating them, their thoughts and solutions into the overall strategy. We also need to make sure that we're being intentional about creating opportunities for the youth to become directly involved in climate action and gain the skills that we need to transform into the future leaders for this movement. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I have a question um, that uh, basically is, is one of our wrap-up questions, and it's um, designed to have each of you speak to it uh, and kind of rapid fire. Um, if you imagine a future that is climate resilient, what are three words that would describe that future? Um, and I will start this time with Ms. Lopez. Technically be forwards, um, vibrant communities and people. Ms. Ajo? Um, proactive, equitable, and thriving. Excellent. Dr. Morton? <laughs> I think I'm getting the side eye. <laughs> no, that was all about me. It's all, <laughs> all about me. Um, I would say just. Investments in communities. <laughs> Those are all, that's a hyphenated one. <laughs> Good call, Marissa. And then the third one would be humanity. Uh, I think people get lost in process and the stuff and all of that and we lose sight of why we're doing this work, which is the people who live in our yeah. communities. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. I love the fact that actually the notion of humanity or people was center for all of those comments. Um, I think those actually pick up on a number of the themes that obviously we've been talking about uh, when we talk about resilience in, in general. Um, but I think each of you in the room could come up with your own descriptors, um, the three words that you think are most reflective, and that might even be worth kind of sharing at the reception tonight because it, there's a lot in those, in those ideas, so I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you to this group again for uh, sharing and for the, more importantly, for the work that you're doing every day. Um, I think the idea of thinking about being able to partner with you all in the future as we, um, as we move out on implementing our framework uh, and uh, finding opportunities uh, to, to work with each of you is gonna be uh, very exciting. Um, and I think will be important in really helping us to achieve all of the milestones that, that we've set up. So uh, give this panel a round of applause. And now we'll turn it over to our next group. Thank you, um, Chair Mallory, and thanks so much to that great panel. Um, I think that was a, a nice transition into our, our next conversation. So I'm Laura Petesh. I'm the Chief of Staff for Climate and Environment and the Assistant Director for Climate Resilience here at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, I'm so pleased to be joined by two uh, wonderful government leaders in community climate resilience. 
So here today I have with me Admiral Rachel Levine, who is the 17th Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and Janie Bavishi, who is the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and the Atmosphere and the Deputy Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Welcome to you both, and thank you for sharing your experiences with us uh, during the summit today. Um, so you have both worked in state and local governments building community resilience. Tell us how those experiences have shaped and informed um, your current roles now. Uh, Admiral Levine? Well, th thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for that question. So um, you are correct. I was the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania before I was in this position. And, you know, uh, I've certainly seen in federal government it's so important to get out of Washington and to go to states and go to communities, and I think that's critically important. Um, as the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania, I, I saw lots of different um, challenges, significant health disparities, both before the pandemic and COVID-19 has certainly shown us the depth and breadth of health disparities. Um, and I saw that driving around Pennsylvania um, when, I was, when I was secretary. Um, one of the, the fantastic visits that I had um, as Assistant Secretary of Health was in Alaska, uh, where I got to go to Alaska. I got out of Anchorage and went to um, nor uh, north, northern Alaska, northwest Alaska, and into Alaska Native communities, and, and saw um, such significant issues in terms of climate uh, climate change and, and the importance of, of resilience. Um, and one of the issues uh, is in terms of uh, traditional Alaska Native foods um, and the impact of climate change on that. Um, we are having having invasive species of fish that are going into the Arctic, um, potentially displacing uh, salmon and other fish that are usually used in native diets. But also, they, they often hunt um, on uh, on the uh, on the ice pack, and the ice pack is changing and is becoming more northern. Some of them have to, some native tribes have to travel farther to the ice pack. So such significant changes um, in climate uh, due to uh, um, that are impacting those local communities. So we have a new office of climate change and health equity, uh, and its sister office of environmental justice that are looking exactly at those health impacts. Thank you so much for sharing and also for drawing the um, attention to the interconnected nature of uh, the health of nature, uh, the importance of cultural heritage, um, subsistence lifestyles, and climate resilience. Uh, everything's very interconnected, so thank you for sharing. Um, Janie? Thanks, Laura, um, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, prior, to, prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, I had the privilege of serving as the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate Resilience. And one of my main takeaways from that experience was the importance of harnessing the power of people. Um, it was uh, the most important asset in my work in New York City was, uh, was an active and engaged constituency that demanded climate action. Um, they made sure that climate resilience was always on the front burner for local officials, and even as the, her the memory of Hurricane Sandy faded. But it was more than that. New York City residents were part of climate resilience solutions. For example, we created a social resilience program which uh, was built on the basic premise of neighbors helping neighbors. Volunteers would check in on vulnerable residents, the elderly, the chronically disabled, mostly from low-income communities, on extremely hot days um, to make sure that they were staying safe. But we actually activated this network in the initial months of COVID more than any other time. And it really goes to show that something as simple as neighbors checking in on each other can be a really important resilience measure for many of the shocks and stresses that we face. But the power of people extended far beyond people checking in on each other. As um, we were designing a flood protection project um, for a community that it would for a community that was devastated by Hurricane Sandy, um, and a project that would protect 110,000 people, including many public housing residents, the residents told us about their community priorities. They wanted flood protection, of course, but they also wanted improved waterfront access. They wanted more recreational amenities. They wanted green spaces to be able to gather as families and have picnics. And all of these priorities were incorporated into the design of the project, which meant that our investment went further, but it also meant that this project was not only making the community safer, but it was improving the quality of life. So extending that to the moment that we're in today, today we've released a framework with opportunities for action. And, and those of you in the room will be participating in roundtables with high-level agency officials and high-level White House officials. And we hope that you will provide your feedback and make sure to 
share your stories, the realities of your work in communities, so that we can make sure that we're effectively supporting you and positioning these opportunities um, to, to really uh, advance local action um, as ambitiously as we can. Thank you very much, Cheney. And yeah, I, I hope you all heard that call to action. I hope everyone gets to stretch before the round tables and, and comes back uh, reinvigorated. Um, and also thank you for highlighting the importance of multiple benefits in addition to climate resilience, because this isn't climate resilience in a vacuum, it's a way to re-envision our communities. Um, so these experiences that you've both shared are invaluable to, to bring to this administration as we move forward on building climate resilient communities. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the work of your agencies in building resilience. Um, Janie, would you like to share? Sure, thanks, Laura. So first, we're listening. Um, just uh, building on the theme of engagement, we're listening and really working to improve NOAA's service delivery to support community partners in becoming resilience, resilient, climate-ready, and prosperous. Um, in fact, right now, we're asking for input on how NOAA's uh, tools, science, information, data can better support and serve users of all disciplines and backgrounds. Um, we've got a request for information out right now. You can respond through October 21st by sending an email to climate.input at noaa.gov or just send us a recorded voice message. We wanted to make it as easy as possible. And really the point here is that we know that our tools and users, tools and, and products are only as valuable um, as the value they provide to, their, to, to our users. So um, please provide your input, it's incredibly important. We're also focused on capacity building. Just today, we announced a new climate adaptation partnerships program, um, a new regional team in the central Midwest region. Um, this award will advance equitable adaptation in an inland community um, that uh, will strengthen place-based capacity to address compounding risks of multiple hazards, but also grounded in the social vulnerabilities that the region faces as well. And we're focused on two important constituencies, uh, tribal nations and women farmland, farmland owners. So um, excited that we're advancing that and excited to make the announcement today. Um, and we're also making proactive investments through the historic bipartisan infrastructure law and inflation reduction act we're in this unprecedented moment right now where we're able to invest in training and technical assistance um, along with uh, investments in implementation and, and these investments really help to make sure the money is going to the places that need it the most for example um, through a trans transformational habitat restoration program we've been able to invest in large-scale restoration of the Whidbey basin area of puget sound and in Washington State. And through a separate habitat restoration funding stream for underserved communities, we were able to invest in a bilingual workforce development program for the Latino community in restoration. So we're hoping that these combined investments will make sure that the uh, job opportunities that come from the implementation grants actually benefit the local workers in this community. But none of these efforts would be possible without strong partnerships with state, local, tribal, territorial, and community partners. Um, so it's just so exciting that we're having this dialogue here today um, and can continue to build those partnerships. Thank you, Janie, and thanks for all the work that you and your colleagues at NOAA are doing to ensure that um, federal government is being responsive to the needs and interests of communities on the ground. Um, Admiral Levine. Well, thank you. And so our work is through this Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, and again, Sister Office of Environmental Justice. So one of the things that we're working on is a uh, White House HHS uh, climate pledge for hospitals and health systems. So we want to work on resiliency within the health sector to the impacts of climate change. And so this pledge, that's exactly what hospitals, health systems, others in the industry are doing, is pledging to work on resiliency, but also to work on decarbonization. Um, and we also have a close association with the National Academy of Medicine, which has a climate collaborative, and I co-chair that, uh, to work on exactly the same type of issues. Um, other products um, our office has is a health sector resource hub where we offer uh, for federal tools and resources in order to, uh, to help hospitals and health systems accomplish that. And, and we have uh, connections to the IRA uh, where there's finances uh, to be able to do that. Uh, there is a climate and health
Health Outlook product that comes out monthly. Um, and our Office of Environmental Justice has the Environmental Justice Index looking at the, um, uh, at, at really a micro level, at a census track level of environmental justice impacts, including the impacts of, of climate change. So we're working as a, uh, as a convener across HHS. Uh, NIH has funding for its first climate and health coordinating center. So it's across HHS and across the federal government uh, to, to develop those resiliency, but also to work on decarbonization. Thank you for sharing and for um, really elevating the nexus of climate and health. It's so important. And as we heard from the mayor earlier, you know, safety is first and foremost for communities and community leaders. So keeping healthcare operations running smoothly um, in a changing climate is an important challenge. Um, so I, um, with if I would love to just hear one final thought from each of you in terms of what resilience practitioners across the nation can do to foster more inclusive and holistic, holistic resilience efforts. Uh, Admiral Levine, then Janie. Well, thank you. So we, we all have to work together to take action and to prepare, and to prepare communities and facilities and states and our nation uh, to the impacts of, of climate change. And um, as I was pointing, um, we were both pointing out, there is funding to do that uh, th through the IRA. There is funding through the Inflation Reduction Act to help, for example, hospitals and health systems do that. So we all have to work together on this, on this really critically important initiative. I'm just going to reemphasize the call to action here. Uh, you know, it's it's incredibly important that um, we hear from you, and that this is really the the start and the continuation, in many cases, of a two-way dialogue between the federal government and uh, local leaders to um, advance adaptation uh, in an inclusive. Um, uh, humanistic um, and uh, uh, equitable way. So thank you all. Great. Um, thank you so much to both of you for sharing your perspectives and um, for your service uh, to the government. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'm pleased to introduce John Podesta, Senior Advisor to the President for Energy Innovation, focused on implementing the Inflation Reduction Act. Thanks so much, Laura. And uh, it's great to come here every day and work with such great colleagues. So I really appreciate uh, the fact that we've gathered all here for the first ever White House Summit on Building Climate Resilient Communities. And this is really an impressive group that's, that's come together. Uh, you're going to hear from me. You're going to hear from my colleague, Mitch Landrieu, who I'll introduce in a minute. And then we're going to break up. And your fourth was the hottest day on record. July was the hottest month on record. And uh, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that they, last summer might have been the coolest summer we experienced for the rest of our lives. <laughs> so that's, that's the challenge that we're trying to come to grips with. It's only September of this year. We've already set a record for the number of climate disasters costing over a billion dollars from the devastating fires in Maui to Hurricane Adelia in the southeast, to the rare tropical storm uh, Hillary in Southern California, uh, to catastrophic flooding in Vermont, upstate New York. Phoenix experienced 31 straight days where the temperature was above 110 degrees. So that's the world we need to plan for, we need to prepare for, uh, and we need to build for and, be, uh, and protect our people in. Um, and that was just the US. <laughs> You know, I could kind of spin around the world and do the same thing uh, in country after country and region after region. We know what we need to do to create a livable future for ourselves and for our children. Um, the IPCC in, in 2018, it was charged in Paris to do a report to the world um, that said, what's the difference between a 1.5 degree world, uh, which uh, particularly uh, the most vulnerable nations were pressing for and the High Ambition Coalition was pressing for, and a two-degree C world, which is what the world was sort of managing to. And uh, what they really, what they said was that difference between 1.5 and 2 is catastrophic for the national, for the natural world, and, w and focused everyone's attention on trying to get uh, to by mid-century to a world where we're 
net zero, where we're taking as much carbon out of the atmosphere as, as we're putting in. Um, and what that would require was a transformation of the global economy on a size and a scale that's never occurred in human history. So that, that's our charge. We have 27 years to have a transformation of the global economy that's never occurred on the size and scale in human history. And, uh, you know, as I noted, the climate crisis is already upon us, and today we've heard how practitioners from across the country are leading at the local level to boast their community resilience. This pro pro uh, problem also demands national leadership uh, to support these local efforts, and it's why President Biden and Vice President Harris are treating the climate crisis as an existential threat that it is. Today, you've heard how we've marshaled a whole-of-government approach to climate resilience, including our new framework, uh, to harness the full power of the federal government uh, to uh, uh, help and to equip communities with the tools and the information uh, they need to become safer, healthy, healthier, more resilient, and more equitable. The Inflation Reduction Act, uh, passed more than just over a year ago, is at the center of that strategy. Uh, it makes the biggest investment in climate action in history to reduce emissions from across all sectors, from power, from transportation, from buildings, from industry, from agriculture and forestry. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, makes the largest investment in climate resilience that we've ever seen. Um, we've awarded, for example, uh, over $1 billion to plant trees in cool city streets in disadvantaged neighborhoods. The differentiation, differential, between poor neighborhoods uh, in the inner city and, and suburban neighborhoods can be as much as 10 degrees across the country, which means more asthma, more uh, effect of uh, heat stroke, et cetera. We're partnering with far farmers on conservation and climate smart agriculture. We've dedicated more than $1.2 million and counting for $1.2 billion and counting uh, for job mitigation uh, in the Southwest through the IRA and more from the bipartisan infrastructure law. We're directing more than $500 million to coastal community resilience. We're restoring our treasured national parks and equipping them to withstand future climate impacts. And today we're announcing even more. NOAA is launching the Midwest Climate Adaptation Partnership which you just heard about. We're proud of what the President's Investing in America agenda means for our nation's uh, ability to withstand the impacts of the climate crisis. We're trying to help uh, to make sure our efforts reach the most vulnerable communities across the country. I know everybody in this room is committed to that. We're grateful for the tremendous partnership we have uh, with cities, with states, with nonprofits, with the private sector, with tribes, and more than a dozen uh, philanthropic organizations that have already invested more than $800 million in climate resilience. We have to keep it up, and we have to keep it up together, really, in partnership. What we've launched today could make all the difference for the parent who works outside 10 hours a day, the family who worries that their house will get flooded, or whether they can afford insurance, or whether there'll be any insurance at all for the uh, young child that waits outside for a school bus every day, for the elderly grandmother who can't afford uh, air conditioning, we have to get on this problem. We owe it to our fellow Americans to help protect them from climate disasters and empower them to build a better future for themselves and their families. That's what this summit is all about. Uh, we have to build that future together. We have to build it in partnership. And uh, the people on my team, and I work uh, closely with uh, Director Mallory and, and her team at CEQ. We're all about trying to create that linkage, those partnerships uh, with, with all of society, with the private sector, with state and local government, with, but with civil society and, and philanthropic uh, uh, partners as well. Uh, now I'm looking around. There he is. <laughs> I'm pleased to turn it over to my friend and partner in implementation, we have a little bit of an unusual structure in this White House. Some of you may know I've been around the track here a couple of times. Um, but President Biden, I think, understood that it's not enough just to pass a bill. You've got to implement it. And uh, I, therefore, have a pleasure of turning it over 
uh, to my friend, someone who knows quite a lot about building back in the face of extreme weather. Uh, he's my partner uh, in implementation, implementing, implementing the bipartisan infrastructure law, the former lieutenant governor of Louisiana, the former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu. John, thank you so much. I'd like to associate myself with John Podesta and all of his comments that he made into Director Mowry to all of you. Mayor, it's nice to see you. Admiral, thank you. It's nice to be with you today. And, and thank all of you for joining us. I know that you've been here quite a long time, and, uh, and I'm, getting, I'm in the middle of, of, of stopping you from getting to your breakout sessions. But I wanted to come spend a couple of minutes with you to give you a, a sense of uh, the work that we're doing on behalf of the President to rebuild a better America. Uh, climate resilience is a, is a topic that, as John said, is literally personally close to me in my life. As, as you know, I am uh, from South Louisiana. Um, this year marks 18 years since Hurricane Katrina uh, ravaged our coast and changed our lives. If you live in New Orleans, um, you, you divide your life in before Katrina and after Katrina. That's how uh, cataclysmic that event was. 18 years ago, um, those levees broke. We all saw it and drowned our city. Floodwaters uh, devastated an area that's nine times the size of Washington, D.C. I know even today that's hard to imagine. It displaced more than 1.3 million people. We lost 1,800 of our brothers and sisters and mother and father and sons and daughters. There are a number of bodies right now in the range of 60 that are still unclaimed uh, from that devastating storm. Uh, for many people in the country, Katrina was uh, clearly a shock to the system. It was a, 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 a symbol of failure uh, of the government to prepare, of the government to respond, a sign of how vulnerable we all are if we don't kind of design a system that takes care of all of us. It was also not just a climate catastrophe. It was, in fact, an infrastructure failure. Those levees that were built, designed, uh, and engineered by the federal government broke uh, when they were not supposed to. Uh, and so now we have to build back better and stronger as a consequence of climate change. But as General Russell Honore said, one of our great heroes uh, of that moment, he said, uh, when climate disasters hit, they amplify the simple fact that when it gets hot, uh, the poor get hotter. And when it gets whole, cold, the poor get colder. And they always get left behind. And that truth remains today in this country. So as mayor of the city of New Orleans through the long recovery following Katrina, I was focused on turning it into a story really of resurrection and redemption from the unlikeliest of places, because that's what most America uh, is really like, moving beyond uh, recognizing uh, what was to what could be. So we decided to rebuild, not as a city that we were, but creating the city that actually we wanted to become which is consistent with the framework of thinking that we should apply to ourselves now, because through it all, we learned a very important lesson, and that is the climate crisis is with us, and we need to build stronger and better infrastructure that can withstand those threats that we know are coming our way and ones that we haven't yet began to fully understand. We know they're coming, as it relates to hurricanes, they're coming faster, they're coming stronger, they're coming in ways that we didn't anticipate before. They're ramping up more quickly uh, than we used to. And of course, that threat uh, is just one of the many threats from drought to wildfires to tornadoes uh, to all of the things that, that all of us experienced in the last uh, many years. Uh, in 2015, at the 10-year mark of Katrina, we in the city of New Orleans uh, released the first resilience plan for a city in the country. I think we were the first city in America to, to, to create something called the, the, the Climate Resilience Offices, and we had a Chief Resilience Officer so that we could begin uh, to actually do the work that um, many of us are doing right now. And just look at how far as a nation we've come in just eight short years from that moment. Resilience now, the idea of resilience, is now baked into the DNA of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and as John uh, enumerated just a minute ago, into the Inflation Reduction Act. It is, it is the, the marrow uh, in the bone of everything that we do. It is the river that runs through it, if you will. 
Uh, we're seeing worsening climate impacts in communities across America, storms, floods, droughts, wildfires, and more. And the President understands this deeply. He knows that the threat to climate change poses to our communities, and he understands the critical importance of all of us standing together in face of those threats. And that's why he fought so hard for this critical funding. That's why uh, he also had the conviction to make climate resilience an administration priority for the first time in American history and to host this first White House summit on climate resilience. And to make sure that our historic investments in resilience will help all of our communities in this country, including those who have been overlooked and left behind in the past. That is a critical part to us. The President says we cannot go forward in America if we do not go forward together. And when we do this, no one will be left behind. And under his leadership, we're building an economy, as you've heard many times, from the bottom up and the middle out, specifically not the top down. Uh, because it doesn't always get to the bottom. In many instances, folks get left behind. We have a country of the haves and the have-nots, and that divide continues uh, to get wider every day. We have to make sure that we go in the other direction, not that one. That commitment is the foundation of his Investing in America agenda, and it really is at the heart of now what everybody is calling, uh, and we proudly accept, as Bidenomics. And there can be no debate. You cannot have a strong economy without having the best infrastructure. It's the cornerstone upon which everything rests. The President believes that we invest in America, when we invest in the people, uh, we invest in ourselves. There is literally nothing that we cannot do. And I know that all of you have been here long enough to know that after decades of talking about Infrastructure Week, which never showed up, this President is the first President in the last 60 years that actually delivered on that promise, and we are bringing the receipts. Yeah, you can clap for that one. We're investing in our roads, our bridges, our ports, our airports, our waterways. We're building high-speed internet because everybody knows access to knowledge is the great equalizer. And a little girl does not need to be sitting in the back of her mama's car outside of McDonald's trying to steal high-speed internet so that she can become the kid that learns how to take us to Mars or solve maternal mortality, or make the world a better place. Amen to that. So just to give you, and, and to have clean air and safe water, and then to build a clean energy economy that John and his team are working so hard on in partnership with all of you. But to give you a sense of how we're doing, eight months, 18 months in, we've announced over $300 billion in funds that we have pushed out of the door. You in the United States of America have planted the seeds for 37,000 projects that are underway and in some level of formation in the country that are reaching over 4,500 counties. 99% of the counties in America have uh, a bipartisan infrastructure law project in them as we speak, and in D.C. and in the territories. Those seeds are now planted. We're going to water them, and they're going to come out of the ground, and it is going to change uh, this country as, as we know it. And as part of that, we're making historic investments, over $50 billion, uh, to make our nation more resilient to the impacts from climate change. Let me just kind of throw some numbers at you. That includes over $8 billion to advance drought resilience, $20 billion to improve the resilience of the power grid, billions for resilience to wildfires, $7 billion to protect our communities from storms, $3.5 billion for flood mitigation, $3 billion to make our coast more resilient. Now, I don't know where y'all are from, but that's called, that's called walking the walk, not just talking to talk, uh, because there's a lot of that hot air that's been in Washington for a very, very long time, and this is the first time somebody put down uh, receipts like that. Um, we're pushing this funding from the historic investments out the door. Earlier this year, the Department of Commerce awarded $562 million for 150 projects across 30 coastal states and territories to ensure that our communities are ready for the impacts of cli climate change on our coast. Just last month, I was back in my home city of New Orleans to announce $3 billion in awards for FEMA for 748 resilience projects across 55 states and territories. $207 million of that funding will go to Louisiana for critical work like elevating six, 753 homes and buildings above floodwaters and ensuring they can stay dry during storms. I visited San Francisco. This is a beautiful day with Speaker Emerita Pelosi dressed in orange to match the color of the Golden Gate Bridge, where we announced uh, an over $500 million investment. I actually think the total number was about 750, but who's counting? Uh, to basically put shock absorbers on the Golden Gate Bridge to withstand 
uh, the challenges that they have from earthquakes and the danger to that area. I also visited the Gila River Indian community in Arizona where we invested $233 million in water infrastructure. That's going to increase that community's re uh, resilience to drought. And now today, as John mentioned and you, you, you all might have read, uh, as part of this summit, we're announcing nearly $500 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Investing in America agenda to keep moving forward on our resilience work. Uh, that breaking down to $328 million from the Department of Interior, who's going to help build additional drought resilience in the West through projects for water recycling, desatellization, and water storage. Because if you haven't noticed, we got a water problem in the West. We're in the midst of a 23-year drought, and we got to get to making that uh, make sure that we, we deal with that in a quick way. We're investing $168 million in grants from the Department of Energy that's gone to states and tribes to build a climate resilient power grid and to help keep the lights on during severe weather events, and nearly $4 million from NOAA to help communities scale up climate adaptation to coastal and inland flooding and wildfire risk. So as you can see, we're not leaving any stone unturned. And as John spoke uh, a little bit earlier, this president's got a good sense that uh, when the talking stops and the bill gets signed, that's just the beginning <laughs> of actually getting the money to the ground and coming out of the ground. And so the president has created in this space, a number of coordinators whose job it is to just get the job done. Now, I love the president, and I think he likes me. <laughs> he used to know my name, but now when he sees me, he doesn't tell me hello anymore. He doesn't ask me how the wife and how the kids. The only thing he says to me is, could you please hurry the hell up? <laughs> to which, of course, I say, yes, sir. <laughs> we will get on it. But what his vision is, is that we have a one team, one fight one voice mentality that on the federal, state, local level, not-for-profits, faith-based organizations, tribal communities, that we all come together in a seamless delivery system, public and private sector, figuring out a way to get these this money out the door, get these projects out of the ground, and changing these communities in real time so that we can build generational wealth that is going to make America so strong that we'll never have to look over our shoulder and, w and wonder whether anybody is ever going to catch us going forward. The only way to get this done is when we do it that way, when we work together, because as the President says at the every speech that he gives, and he may be speaking shortly after me, he will say, we are the United States of America. There is nothing that we cannot do if we do it together, right before he says, God bless America and God save the troops. He says it in every speech that he has, and he's repeating it over and over again because it is the simple truth that when we do things together, we can do big things. And when we don't, we have a really difficult time getting anything done. None of this is possible without cooperation, coordination, collaboration. But what, everything is possible when we do it the way the President has asked us to do it. So that is our call. That is our charge. We're not building it back like it was. We're building it back the way it should have been. And we're going to build it in a way that can withstand whatever's coming our way. And you're the ones who are going to make it happen. So thank you all so very much for being here today. And now, Lenny. And let me turn it over. Are you coming up? So how does so she can tell us where we're going? Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Mitch. Um, OK, that is going to conclude our formal speaking program for today. Um, I think you can tell by the, the breadth of leadership that we had in the room that um, really every, every corner of federal government and this administration is, is standing in partnership with you and your communities to help um, build a climate resilient nation from the ground up. Um, it's the White House, so we have to do a lot of talking at you, but we did commit to spending the majority of the summit hearing from you. Um, for those of you who are tuned in on the live stream, um, just hang tight for another 10 minutes or so, and we'll kind of reconfigure, and you'll be able to um, tune into one of those roundtable discussions. Um, also, do feel free to, to find us. There's contact information you know, for the White House and all the different components that you heard from today um, to give us your reactions on the summit, on the framework, um, so we can go ahead and conclude the live stream. Um, for those of you who are here in person, um, we'll go ahead and transition to the in-person roundtable discussions. Those will all be on the second floor of the building. Staff are going to be here to help guide you to the correct roundtable. Your roundtable number is on your name tag, and there are signs outside of the suite of rooms that we'll be using um, that you, know, you can match sort of your roundtable number to the room that you're going into. Um, we'll start those roundtable discussions right at uh, 2.35, so if you could just sort of move quickly
quickly from here to there, that would be great. Um, if you are part of the live streamed roundtable, you already know that, please stay here um, and just hang tight and we will move towards, um, towards that. Thank you so much. and the funding announcements that have been gone over in the, in the plenary. I think those are important steps, but you're far closer to the ground, the people at this table. We have some uh, representatives from the federal family here as well, but I think this is a chance uh, for some uh, give and take to hear what's going on, what we're doing right, what we could do better, um, what uh, sometimes I think the real uh, both focus effect and where the work really gets done is like not just at the city level, but almost block by block, ridge by ridge, uh, to ensure that people um, know uh, and have the resources to, to, to plan for what, uh, what might be coming. We're, we've posed uh, a few questions uh, to just to stimulate the conversation. In a minute, I'm gonna ask everybody to go around the table and introduce themselves, but uh, I think if you can kind of focus, uh, and I'll try to just moderate the discussion, uh, on the ways climate change is impacting your community right now. I mean, we have experts who have had to experience extreme heat, ex a fire, flooding, uh, the, you know, the biblical plagues, the locusts, uh, droughts, uh, but uh, if we could focus uh, particularly on, uh, and let us know what you're feeling, what, what's happening in your communities. Uh, your experience with federal funding, including the investments from IRA and Bill, um, ARP before that, that can help uh, increase climate resilience at the local level, and how we can really build that partnership. How are we going to work more closely together uh, to protect communities from uh, disasters and empower them to build safe and, and healthy communities? Uh, I'd like to start uh, with a quick uh, round of introduce, uh, introductions and then you know sort of dive in what's working, what's not working. Mayor, you wanna go first? Thank you very much. Um, Satya Rhodes-Conway, I'm the mayor of Madison, Wisconsin. Thanks, uh, Mr. Podesta, for the opportunity to be here and for the whole team putting to, uh, today's event together. David Hondula, I direct the Office of Heat Response and Mitigation in the city of Phoenix, the very city that had the 31-day stretch you mentioned out of 55 total 110-degree days this, this summer. Thanks, David. Elise Gout, I emailed with some of you. I'm a policy advisor in the Office of Clean Energy Innovation and Implementation. Part of my portfolio includes climate resilience. Thanks. Hello, I'm Jennifer Raleigh Collins. I'm senior advisor to Dr. Corey Wiggins, who is the federal co-chair for the Delta Regional Authority, and I advise him on federal partnerships and program integration. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Jennifer Hirado. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for Broward County, located in Southeast Florida. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Hi, Robert Abbott, Fire Chief with Travis County, ESD6, and just on the outskirts of Austin, Texas, which in the last couple months would have made you feel like we were in Phoenix. Uh, but uh, we've, we've been involved for many years with flood mitigation work through the Pew Foundation, Charitable Trust Foundation, but also through uh, other areas relating to wildfire and risk and community assessments. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pat Swanson. I wear lots of hats. I'm a farmer actually from Iowa, and I also serve on the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation Board of Directors and uh, on the American Soybean Association. So uh, I'm wearing many hats, and I appreciate the opportunity to be at the table. Um, my name is Phil Tu Ego. I'm the executive director for the Sichangu Lakota Treaty Council under the Sichangu Lakota Oyate. Um, the federal government um, knows us as the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. We call, call ourselves the Sichangu Lakota Oyate. We recently got a, a funding to do a, a climate adaptation plan and, um, and then an implementation grant um, on treaty lands. 
Hi, thank you for having me here today. My name is Jenny Shackling. I'm with American Forest. I'm the senior manager of urban forestry. I also provide service leadership to the Detroit Tree Equity Partnership with core partners at the Greening of Detroit, the City of Detroit, and DTE Energy Corp. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, let's dive in. Uh, Wait, Marissa. Oh, Marissa <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, that, that, uh, I, I apologize. No. The, uh, that's really Mike fun. confused me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Marissa McKinnis from uh, Department of Defense. I work on climate resilience, our climate adaptation planning, and I have a history working with um, EPA and um, uh, local governments and uh, tribal governments on their plans. Happy to be here. So having skipped over you, maybe I'll, Marissa, I'll ask you the first question. Are you mostly focused on, on uh, issues around bases, or are you, uh, what's, your, what's the Defense Department's interface with the uh, community resilience? Yes, great question. So my uh, the main office that I'm in is focused on installations, energy, and environment. Uh, so we're really focused on um, stuff inside the fence line, but we're also, we also have very, uh, several very creative programs that work outside the fence line as well with communities um, and thinking about encroachment and compatible use. So um, it's a mixture of both. Okay. okay. Uh, well, let's dive in. I, I, I sort of put a few questions on the table, which is uh, really focused on uh, maybe what your current, what threats or what challenges are you currently experiencing, and has the uh, have these federal programs and federal partners been uh, been successful in trying to provide some support? And you know, what 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 should we be doing better? Maybe Mayor. I'll see can start with you. Thank you very much. Um, so it, from the perspective of the city of Madison, um, you heard me say a little bit earlier, certainly flooding is a big concern, air quality issues, big concern, heat island impact. Um, I mean, I'm just sort of broadly worried about the ability of our infrastructure to withstand, whether we're talking about pavement buckling because of heat or whether we're talking about there being less snow and more ice in the wintertime and what that freeze-thaw cycle does to pavement and, um, and buildings. And so it, you're just broadly looking at the need to understand how the, the, not our previous climate, but our future climate is going to impact all of our public works. Um, that's a really big deal for us. Um, we are um, at looking at also how we improve um, the housing for folks and the, the healthiness and quality of housing. Um, and I'll, I'll just lift up a couple of, of examples of places where I think federal funding has really made a difference. Um, the Resilient Retrofit Program, and this is not, these are not all in Madison, but um, we cities learn from each other, right? We steal ideas uh, and, and partner. Um, so the Resilient Retrofit Program um, within the IRA um, has allowed Minnesota residents in HUD-assisted housing to see direct investments in energy efficiency and climate resilience in their buildings. In Madison, we have a program um, that, where we are retrofitting non-subsidized affordable housing, so not HUD housing, um, f again, for energy efficiency, but we hope to layer on renewable energy, um, mold mitigation, lead mitigation, um, and we are hopeful that we might get funding um, through the IRA for that as well. Um, and then, I mean, we've heard about it already, but you look at, there's been millions of dollars in funding for habitat restoration, coastal resilience. Uh, I mean, this is all impacting cities across the country. And so I think a lot of the, the funding coming through um, the IRA certainly has helped. Just one other example, um, in Madison we have, we got, uh, thanks to Mitch, 
uh, Landrew, we got a, a very large grant for to redo some bridges, and it's a causeway between a bay and a lake, and and they're falling apart. We got to redo them, but we're going to be able to build them back in a way that is um, more resilient from a stormwater perspective, but also makes more space for bicyclists and pedestrians, and then hopefully that will lower our um, transportation emissions into the future. So I think there's a lot going on, lots of opportunities, um, and lots of really good work being done with the federal funding. Thank you. Improves the quality of life, too. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's great. Uh, Phil, you, you mentioned you you just recently, uh, we'll go around the horn, but uh, uh, gotten a grant uh, to, to do a adaptation plan. You wanna, can you describe that? or And what, what work's being done at this point? Um, we we are just now um, launching our project. So um, what what's unique about our uh, plan is that we are including um, traditional Lakota knowledge into this plan. We have a term that's called um, Makasi Tomnia, which is the um, biosphere, which is Earth, everything in, in on on this Earth. And our our number one concern was water. Um, we have the Missouri River around us. Um, the, our, our treaty territory boundaries are around the Missouri and um, the uh, Platte River and, uh, you know, the uh, Republican River. It's all around us. And uh, we're very concerned about our water and also our, our health, our health um, situation back home. We're seeing in instances of uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, and... Um, Heart, uh, heart disease, and um, we want to monitor our water. So the, the implementation grant um, is, what we're going to do with that is to um, launch or install some uh, sensors across treaty lands so that we can um, uh, monitor the water. We want to monitor the climate, uh, earth, earth, um, air, and uh, um, uh, water. and. Um, the, the problem, um, Mr. Podesta, is that um, all around the treaty territory, we have some mining going on in the Black Hills. These are um, difficult issues to bring up. I know so you're all doing probably doing wonderful things, but for us, um, there was the, um, the Mining Act of 18-something uh, that's being used. And there's, there's uh, uranium mining, there's gold mining, there's lithium mining and rare earth mining going on, and the, the gold miners are back in the Black Hills. So we feel that um, um, that was one of um, our concerns um, and the reason to uh, go after this uh, climate um, uh, grant. And uh, there's a lot of other things that um, we're looking at. We want to, other things that need to be done is to ask the president to remove the Black Hills from the um, mining Act, because um, we feel that uh, ancient stories tell us that the water underneath the Black Hills reaches us in the, on the reservation. The Rosebud the Reservation is located in South Central South Dakota, and we feel that that's why our people are getting sick. Mm -hmm. So w here we are, you're doing wonderful things with the climate money, but you're looking away from all this mining and things that are going on around us. Um, we understand what's going on with the heat, the earth heating. When Chimaka is our mother earth, she's heating up. But, you know, as you recall, in the old days, the, we lived in teepees. But now we lived in uh, uh, stick-built homes. So, but those are, um, are not going to be um, good for us in the future, especially with the price of lumber and things like that going up. We have our own resources. Uh, we have... We have clay, we have sand, we have gravel, we have timber. We can build our own homes. Um, I looked at something called a, um, earth bricks that we could use 10% cement and then 90% uh, 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 clay. And we have all those resources, but we, can't, we haven't been using it the way we should, the way we could. But there, that's sort of the, the thing about our project. So I, I want to give others uh, time to... That's <clears throat> terrific. Um, I would just note 
I think the Mining Act was passed in 1872. <laughs> yeah. I know that Ulysses S. Grant signed yes. the Act. That's now, some law. people think that 150 years, maybe you should update the law. Right. Right. And we just issued a report on, uh, on that, one of the uh, coming out of the White House. Um, and I think one of the things that was, the, uh, that was focused on in that report is the need for early consultation, and particularly when tri tribal equities are involved, uh, sovereign to sovereign uh, conversations before, during the, if you get involved earlier in the process, you can sometimes avoid the, uh, the uh, conflicts that, that come. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're now in the throes of needing uh, to develop a value chain on critical minerals, et cetera. So this comes up across the country and particularly out in the West. But um, I, hear, I hear what you're saying and hopefully the Congress will begin after 150 years to decide that it's maybe time to <laughs> update the law. So I will carry your suggestion to them. Uh, Pat, maybe you go next, say what's going on in, in uh, farm country. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so we do farm in southeast Iowa. Our family's been farming for over 175 years on the, some of the same land. So we've been very focused on climate for a very long time. Even longer than the mining act. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so it's very important to us that, um, you know, that we do take care of the water. We take care of the soil. I mean, we've been doing this for generations, and um, my husband and I are the sixth generation on the land, wow. and my daughter is That's expecting um, generation eight. <laughs> so we're Excellent. very excited about that. So, yeah, so we, we've spent a lot of time um, using new technologies to help us, um, you know, with our, with our conservation efforts. Um, we have used um, the terraces to keep our soil on our land. We have highly erodible ground in southeast Iowa, so it's very important that our soil stays there. And so we do what we can, the no-till practices, um, no tillage um, or minimal tillage, just you know what, what we need to keep that soil there. We do a lot of grass um, out of our um, acres of land. We have about 40% in grassland um, with our pastures for our cattle. Um, we also raise cattle and corn and soybeans, and so we try to keep that that land there, that soil there. The grass is used to filter um, into the waterways on our on our land. So we're filtering nutrients before they get into the waterways. So we're doing what we can. Um, I also serve on the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, so crop insurance is still a very important um, tool that farmers have to keep us, um, I like to say financially, um, sustainable as well. So farmers uh, need, you know, we use a lot of loans from banks um, to keep us going, operating loans, and the bankers really like that we have crop insurance that helps us to um, guarantee um, a certain amount of income each year so that we we are able, and the farmers help pay for that too. You know, I have my my crop insurance bill sitting waiting for me when I get home to pay. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's a partnership, definitely. Um, we appreciate the Federal Crop Insurance uh, Corporation, the Federal, um, Federal Crop Land, uh, Crop Insurance, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, so it's an important, important part. And uh, we do, I also serve on the Iowa Soybean Association and the American Soybean Association. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that um, government may wanna do, we spend a lot of time on research with our checkoff dollars that farmers voluntarily, um, you know, we've, we've come up with the checkoff program, um, the farmers did and the farmers are paying into that. And so we use a lot of those funds to do research. And that research, I mean, we've been testing water on our farm for um, uh, years. And, and the lab, we have a water lab right in the Iowa Soybean Association that we're actually testing water, which was one of the things that really attracted me to get involved with them, is just that, wow, we're, we, they really care. We really care about the water and what, um, and what we're sharing with everyone. So we're doing everything we can to keep every, our food safe, our water safe, um, not just for our generation, but like I said, for that next generation coming down the road. One of the things that um that Secretary Vilsack has focused on is, uh, he, while he's uh, put a lot of emphasis using traditional programs through the CCC 
and on climate smart agriculture, but there was a large infusion of funds from the IRA uh, in that program. And I'm wondering in farm country, how's that going over? Because yeah, so. <laughs> I think whether that's sequestering carbon in the soil or, or helping farmers uh, through the REAP program meet their uh, energy needs through more renewable sources. Absolutely. Is it resonating? Absolutely. It timed me out, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the Iowa Soybean Association, we started the Ag Outcomes Fund about six, five or six years ago, and we were really looking forward, you know, forward thinking on what can we do to help farmers to be able to afford doing these practices, right? Cover crops, we've done co cover crops actually for generations on our farm, um, you know, to keep the soil there, to keep the water from running off, and um, we think that those funds are definitely helping um, to get other farmers involved in those practices. They're, you know, the, the Ag Outcomes Fund helps give monies towards um, farmers that are in, introducing these new practices on their farm. So it definitely is helping. I think, um, I think we've expanded our program with the funds um, to 10 states now. So we're not just focusing on Iowa, but we're focusing on, focusing on other cropland states around us. And so I think it's um, definitely helpful. And it you know, cost us about $35 an acre to put covers on our farms. And, um, and I think that those programs help. So thank you for that. Right. And of course, the farm bills up for yes. authorization this year. <laughs> We're so spending a lot of time on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Great yes. debate around that. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Chief, maybe I'll call on you next. Sure. Well, thank you again. And uh, we have a lot going on in Texas. Texas is a state like many other states that can flood and burn at the same time, and often it does. More recently, we see these reoccurrences. In a lot of, do, in, in a lot of responses to wildland is, is mainly in the central Texas and northern parts of the state, and then we have, obviously have a lot of flooding concerns and coastal concerns in, in the south. Uh, there's been a couple points that we have found throughout working with grant funds that depending on the size of government that's receiving it, whether it be the state, whether it be a city, or whether it be a special district, the further it goes through some pass-through funding, sometimes those amounts don't actually end up being what they are in the, in the front of it. And we do know that's not just in Texas. We do know that's <laughs> throughout the nation. And in doing that, we also find other avenues to engage a community at a very micro level By the to way, where some neighborhood. Mayors never complain about this. About <laughs> right. their, their I, I know she's got it covered. Uh, so, so, yeah. so when we see that, you know, we, we do see a lot of communities that are somewhat underutilized when it comes to carrying this torch yeah. and in and, and both in all the facets of everything we're talking about here at the summit. And a lot of that is, is special districts, for example, they can pivot very quickly uh, because they have to. That's by design how they how they work. And we look at cities and we look at counties, there's a lot of now sharing of services that once did not exist. I mean, for every city they had their own of this and then the county had their own of this and you're competing for the same grant funds. So we're seeing that improve, which is excellent as well. The challenge is with a state that has the droughts that we do and the fire concern that we've experienced for many years, much like the other states, is that we're now seeing insurance premiums go up as well on residential properties to the point where some insurance companies, whether it's because this is prone to flooding or uh, lower lying areas, they're not rebuilding and developing those, so there's not an economic drive there. Or if you look at the wildland concern, there's a lot of insurance companies now assessing whether or not they're gonna stay in that business. And they've given notice to their policyholders that they do not plan to renew, or if they do plan to renew, it's gonna be substantially higher than what they've anticipated. Now, we have a number of mitigation plans. We have a wildfire mitigation team that does nothing but wildfire mitigation work in our area. There's a report that was just published yesterday in the final report to Congress from the Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission, and it's very detailed. It was a short turnaround they, ha they had to get all this information together, but it's an excellent report. I recommend everybody read it. Some of the things that are highlighted in there is going to be something that is, I think, shared among all of us, no matter what the discipline is, and that is making sure that local government is included early on in these projects uh, and truly has a seat at the table and not coming in after the fact or finding that there was a grant awarded to an area they didn't even know the grant was coming. They, they, they were just as surprised as anybody else. And that has happened, but I think we've taken better steps to reduce that because a lot of the discussion and expectation of what's going to be coming can be ironed out in the beginning part of it, which I think we all know communication is key there. But really, this all has a rubber band effect, whether it be insurance 
whether it be flooding of crops or the drought that affects the crops. We are obviously in this together and through mitigation efforts, both the flooding and wildland, we can, I think, uh, help some of the other folks that are experiencing the same things while different disciplines. Is this, I know the state of California, to some extent in Florida, they're trying to tackle this insurance problem. Is that anything going on in Texas these days? I'm yes, right now, is the, probably the biggest thing we're seeing is the uh, concerns of wildland. There are certain areas of Texas that are much more prone to wildland fires than maybe the southern, even though the southern part of the state, they do have them. The significant um, ex expansion of the cities and the metropolitan areas into yeah. what's called the WUI, the wildland urban interface area, has obviously brought that to the front center, where now we have populations where 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have any populations. Uh, in, the, in the right markets, these communities can develop very quickly within a couple of years from start to finish, where before you had no population in a small rural county, now you may have 6,000 plus 10,000 small city, just within years. So the, the, the big thing we're seeing, obviously the lack of water, uh, our reservoirs are drying up like they are in other parts of the, the US, but I think the next wave of impact will be in the pockets of Americans that are suffering from the in, in, increased insurance, insurance rates that they're experiencing because of these mm -hmm. disasters. Well, let's stick with trees for a second. <laughs> oh, except, uh, let's t rather than too much fuel load, let's talk about too few trees. <laughs> Jenny, what 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 are you seeing uh, in the in the urban forestry space? Yeah, too few trees. Absolutely, but this funding isn't going to help with that. Um, where do I start with the traits issues? I feel like we would be here all day. Um, just to kind of paint a picture of a scenario of what occurs, the, the outdoor air quality is so bad, the recommendation is to shut your windows. Um, the heat disparity in some of our cities is plus 19 degrees Fahrenheit. The majority of our residents do not have air conditioning. It has been predicted that in a combination power outage and heat wave, the entire population is at risk. That's 680,000 people. I don't know if we have enough body bags for that, but let's get ahead of that, and trees are a really great way to do that. So pivoting back towards kind of the hope um, that trees can provide, uh, we at American Forests are so proud to have been selected by the Forest Service to be one of 12 groups that are gonna help get these funds out in an equitable and responsible way. That is, that is our goal. Um, we want to make sure that they are delivered equitably and that they incentivize holistic, community-led programs that really impact people's daily lives because it is a daily struggle. Um, we talk about climate threat and we talk about climate disasters, but it is an all-day, everyday situation when you live in an environmental injustice zone, in an area that has non-attainment standards, in an area where there are not protective ordinances and you are co-located, as has been mentioned, with these other activities. So while we can plant trees, there's still refining operations going on next door to a recreation center where we tell our children to go outside and play. So that becomes a little difficult. Um, but, but through this funding, we will absolutely be able to um, address some of those significant and very disproportionate issues that have been impacting our urban communities, like my hometown of Detroit. Um, and we're going to be delivering robust resources and technical assistance to folks so that they can plan, plant, and care for trees that really are solution multipliers. We talked about um, built environments been mentioned. Well, you know what's gonna increase the longevity of those built materials by about 10 years by reducing the UV exposure? Tree shade. Right, so the rubber band effect, right? Trees in of themselves have intrinsic value and a long, long list of extrinsic values. But they also supplement all the other investments that we put into the other functions of infrastructure. Clean water, they do that. Transportation, they protect our roadways. In the city of Detroit, we have the Windsor border. That bridge carries $360 million worth of goods into our country every day. Those goods are headed for every other state and are critical to thousands of supply chains. So, so this is like a tree issue, and it's a health issue, and it's an economic issue, and it's a national security issue for us now 
and our future. And as you pointed out, tremendous equity issue. Maybe that's a good segue to Atiyah, the work you're doing. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, sir. Uh, so first of all, thank you for everything you said. That was amazing um, and, and actually is a great tee up because um, for two things. So first I wanna set the stage for uh, addressing a lot of misconceptions about black communities. So a lot of times we think of black communities, we think of urban, urban core, and that's where all the black people in America are. However, uh, if we look at the data, it's about a 40, 40, 20 split. So about 40% of black people live in the urban environment, 40% live in suburban environments, and 20% live in rural areas. That's a lot of black people in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And so what we've seen um, with the impacts of climate change is the, uh, like everyone has said, you know, two big buckets, right? Heat and water, right? Flooding. Um, and so this, this uh, uh, the impacts that we're seeing on the ground, we're really seeing them um, a lot after disasters. And we're seeing the worsening of the pre-existing conditions that communities were already dealing with. So if there were zoning issues beforehand, there are zoning issues afterwards. Um, and in fact, we have worked in some of the communities we've worked with after disasters, we've seen uh, zoning codes change in a way that impacted people's ability to rebuild their homes. They needed more money than what their insurance allowed for to rebuild their homes because of the changes in the zoning. In essence, pushing people out of their own communities. Um, the second um, uh, piece that I wanted to mention, um, kind of if we think about this, kind of 40% in the urban environment, 20% in the rural environment. Um, in urban communities, what we're seeing is uh, money comes to local government and we love when local government has money to invest in communities, and um, it means that there's a lot of coordination that has to happen on the ground with community-based organizations who are closest to the people, closest to the pain and suffering, closest to the strengths in communities and building on yeah. those strengths in communities because folks have had to be hyper, superhuman, uh, or had to have hyper superhuman level of resilience to just exist, and, and their presence alone is a level of resilience. Um, that I think we, we need to pay homage to, but also the investments necessary for people to play the leadership roles that they have been playing um, before, during, and after disasters that are related to climate change. Um, the last thing uh, is on the rural side. Um, on the rural side, we've seen um, a lot of challenges with uh, community members having voices um, after climate disasters, in particular, on uh, the infrastructure that gets set up after disasters, things like long-term recovery committees. Um, so we see in a lot of communities um, that the folks who live in the community it, are not represented on these committees that are um, making decisions about how the limited recovery resources are distributed. And in essence, folks who need it the most don't get it. And is related to that um, is our need to uh, focus more on recovery as a part of climate adaptation. Um, so we don't really have a clear strategy um, for recovery um, and how it relates to resilience and resources that can actually be invested in communities. Once you get past uh, day 31, as one of our members, Joe Gilliam of Unity and Disasters often talks about, day 31, all of the usual resources that you see after a disaster yeah. leave and you're left with the community trying to figure out a lot of things for themselves. Um, and so we just need more strategy at the local, state, and federal level on what do we do after communities have been impacted and how do we help uh, maintain the historical and cultural preservation um, of communities as a part of that. We're uh, at the federal level, you know, trying to think about how the Stafford Act interacts with that so that we build back for the future and not just what replace what was was there. And sometimes we don't even do a very good job of that. Uh, we've got a, you know, a little, maybe a little about 10 minutes. I'd like to get everybody in. Let's go to water. <laughs> you're in, yeah. Jennifer, you're in hurricane belt. Yeah, we, <laughs> What's we, going on? What's going on in Broward? Yeah, we have water and heat. Um, yeah, so many of the points that have already been expressed, I think um, the primary issues that we recognize in Broward and Southeast Florida is the challenge of compound flooding. So we're dealing with rising sea that it's affecting our groundwater table, which affects our drainage and water management systems. We have rainfall intensification that's contributing to 100-year flood elevations. 
that continue to rise alongside sea level, which contributes to coastal flooding and hinders the ability of our uh, systems to discharge to tide. Uh, we had a 26-inch rainfall event in six hours um, in April, saw five feet of flooding at our Fort Lauderdale uh, Internet, Hollywood International Airport. Communities that are disadvantaged with two to three feet of standing water, mm -hmm. thousands of vehicles that were lost, a one in a thousand year storm event, but three years ago we had about another one in a five and hundred year storm event that we also couldn't drain because of excessively high tides and and uh, three years before that, we had another, you know, I don't know where it rated, another 18-inch mm -hmm. rainfall event. So we're, we're dealing with this quite regularly. The insurance issues are very severe, um, not just flood, which of course we're concerned about, but if there were any opportunities for assistance in terms of transparency and pricings and earnings and loss prevention. I saw a national uh, uh, insurance uh, estimate that we were extreme highs at about 1,400 a year. In South Florida, we're paying 8,000 and more for standard homeowner's insurance before we're even looking at flood insurance and others. So we're at a point where housing affordability is already an issue because of no place to build, loss of land, we're completely built out, outside investors. But when you look at just the issue of insurance, and whether or not we're going to be able to keep people working in a community, coastal communities all together contributing, what, 50% to the national GDP. Right. We need to find places for people to affordably, safely, sustainably, you know, work and live. And we have those abilities uh, within our communities. Um, but we do need accountability for those who are, um, you know, contributing to the economics of a region. Um, I want to celebrate that um, we've been working on a countywide resilience plan that addresses the combination of flood and heat, working to integrate green infrastructure as part of those investments. We'll be rolling things out significantly in this next year. But the NOAA uh, Climate Resilience Grant Funding, which we're all uh, really excited about, provides these examples to show how we can holistically address these whole of issues through capital projects that deliver you know, um, on, on heat and community health and integrating of job opportunities and pipelines. We see these types of funding opportunities coming now, the infrastructure investments that we've been waiting for for a decade. So there's a lot of promise in terms of these monies coming at precisely the right time. We're thrilled as a region to be uh, pursuing the climate pollution reduction uh, grant funding as well. We have our entire um, Palm Beach, Broward, Miami, Dade, Monroe County collaborating there with our cities. And um, very excited. State excite took a pass on that. Excuse me. The state took a pass on. That. I we know that, and we know that the only reason that we're able to participate is again this ability to ensure local governments can be direct recipients. We can't be shut out of opportunities because of you know whether they might be administrative hurdles or whatever else might deter a state or um, others from participating. So. Um, also, uh, noting the, um, I just want to note the direct um, rebates, the direct pay that's Correct. allowing uh, local governments to take advantage of what, you know, these incentives that bring down the costs of solar and um, credits for our EV investments, those have really been um, paramount in terms of our being able to expand and accelerate our own commitments to net zero. But I would acknowledge that ability to continue to bring funds directly to local government as well as expand the ability of community um, uh, partnerships, community-based partners to be more directly involved. There's just far too much work to do. All of the additional contracting is additional time process, administrative effort. We know somebody has to, to go through that, but having more direct funding to those community-based partners to help ready us for the infrastructure investments that come is, um, is a, a way to you know, enhance, enhance what's being delivered. We're very, uh, <clears throat> I just want to pause, and we'll, we'll get everybody in, but to, uh, on what Jennifer said at the end, which is one of the very uh, interesting, almost unique, there was one small precedent for this, is what we're referred to as direct pay, which is for cities, states, community-based groups, nonprofits, uh, you know, uh, religious organizations, et cetera, they, it's not a competitive program, 
if you meet the criteria, you put a project into service, whether that's community solar or uh, changing over your fleet, et cetera, you get a check from the treasury, even if you're not a federal taxpayer. So not only the private sector benefits from that, that kind of funding, but uh, uh, particularly cities, counties, community-based organizations have a big opportunity to, to build, build uh, uh, community-based assets. Jennifer, what, why don't I call on you next? Oh, thank you so I'll very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity for Delta Regional Authority uh, to be in the room and to hear this very robust discussion. Uh, we are a federal agency uh, that uh, we support 252 counties along the Mississippi River uh, from Lower Illinois and Missouri all the way down to, New, uh, to Louisiana plus parts of the Alabama Black Belt. And so our entire region, all 252 counties, are persistently impoverished, uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, and so they are constantly dealing with issues, uh, weird constantly, because it is home for me as well, dealing with issues of both water and heat. Um, and our communities are impacted. Our communities are largely rural communities. Um, and they are, uh, according to, um, if you look at the IRA um, map, a lot of our communities are coal communities. And so uh, Delta Regional Authority focuses its efforts on um, making sure we're making investments in an equitable way, really elevating equity under Dr. Wiggins, uh, who's our federal co-chair under his leadership. Uh, we make investments, uh, infrastructure investments around transportation. We make investments around workforce development. We make in, uh, investments around water and sewer as well as flood mitigation. And so all of the issues that uh, each of the communities have talked about are the areas where we are weighing in on behalf of our communities. One of the questions you asked at the top is the experience that uh, local communities are having with the federal government. A lot of our communities are having challenges and we recognize that. So we've put a quite a number of resources into capacity building mm. to allow, to help those communities to be able to access. Because you can just say equity, but are you really creating the pathway so that there's access to, to the federal resources? Um, DRA, like our sister uh, commissions and authorities, is uniquely um, structured in that we work with states uh, to make these, to identify what these uh, investments are, but the money comes directly from us to the entity applying. So eligible entities uh, are uh, nonprofits, they are local governments, uh, they are tribes that can apply for the money directly from us. It does not it's not couched in the state, and then you hope the state shares it with your rural and uh, community that has often been un, uh, underserved. Uh, we are the recipient of $150 million out of the bipartisan infrastructure law, and uh, to quote Dr. Wiggins, uh, we're doing everything we can to get every dime back out to the communities uh, from which that money came. That's right. Uh, David, what was it like having the hardest job in America this summer? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> and what do you have to look forward to? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, we're certainly appreciative of bipartisan infrastructure law and IRA funding that is going to help us address the really serious challenges from uh, from heat in in Phoenix. Uh, challenges that all of our communities experiences uh, experience. Challenges that are underrepresented in official statistics, whether they be mortality or morbidity indicators, yeah. costs, quality of life impacts. I mean, I'm. I'm still moved by a, a story someone told me at a neighborhood meeting years ago about how they were so frustrated they just couldn't get home from the grocery store without their ice cream melting, right? It's, it's those quality of life, the everyday that you mentioned that, that represents the, the challenge. We're a very proud recipient of the uh, urban and community forestry investment uh, as well that we see as a central part of the portfolio. And as we read the language in the, the funding guidance, as we read the the framework, we are, are working very hard to build the pathway to the federal resources that you mentioned at the nitty gritty level of what does it mean for a small community based organization to engage with local government from a procurement standpoint? Mm -hmm. Is every step of the legal process available in English and Spanish? Those are the types of conversations my, my teammates are working hard on uh, right now. But while we have your ear, 
Uh, you referenced the, the Stafford Act, uh, and folks may be aware that there's pending legislation that would add extreme heat to the Stafford Act. And while we don't need to have that, that discussion right now, I think it's a signal or an indicator of how we're still learning how to address heat at all levels of government. Where does it, where does it fit in? And, and our ask from the city of Phoenix uh, would be for, for more attention at the level of the individual funding opportunities. We feel like we're still square peg round holing it a little bit, trying to work heat projects into these really significant investments. We hear the language, we see the, the interest in funding heat, but we're still having a hard time making it, worth, uh, making it work in those individual funding applications. For example, if we see a calculator that asks for what the probability of heat is in Phoenix, it's, it's one, right? It's going to happen every, and the same in Texas, the same in Florida. And, and we're just having a hard time answering those types of questions in a, in a compelling, uh, competitive way. So at that level of funding opportunities where we think there's a really big opportunity to open the door for more communities to bring their really, uh, really good heat ideas forward. Thank you. Great, I'll talk to my colleagues about that. That's really, that's very helpful. Um, Marissa, I asked you this at the beginning, but maybe I'll deepen a little bit uh, your experience in trying to integrate what you're trying to do uh, at the installation level with the effects of conversation with the community and the impact on the community. Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think one thing that, um, um, a, I re was really planning on just listening here, listening in, so uh, really excited to hear everything that's happening um, and that what you guys are facing. So I think one thing that, you know, we're listening to all of the issues, when you think of an installation, it has all of those different pieces. It has a school, it has education, it has housing, it has in off-base housing and um, on-base housing, it has um, health, it has all the different pieces, like it's tiny little cities everywhere. And so we have to deal with, um, with all the issues at once, and at the same time, you know, water and electricity and things that we are, um, we're providing on base, uh, those exist off base too. So, uh, you know, we have to work with our local communities. Uh, Seventy percent of our resident, seventy percent of our uh, service members live off base, and so we have to think about the roads that get to that base. We have to think about, you know, I was just in Mayport um, a few months ago, and and all of their roads are kind of flooding out in, in Florida, and really trying to think about, that's the one place, that's a single point of failure. Uh, we need to look at and see how we get that up and work with the community to make sure that our mission is still um, it is still intact. And so thinking about that from the, um, not only from the mission standpoint, but our mission relies on the people and the resources around the installation as well. Um, so one other thing that I, I just want to mention is that, you know, from, from the water resilience lens, I think that's something where we have to think holistically and from the watershed level. And so we're doing a lot of cooperative work um, with communities um, through a couple of our different of our programs um, and would love to kind of think about leveraging that with, um, with the, some of this funding. I think one of the things that's uh, emphasized in the strategy that we released today is also building and providing those tools that are gonna be essential for people to be able to kind of plan for the future, understand the likely effects. We're, uh, every five years uh, since the H.W. Bush administration, the, the country uh, gets its best scientists, both inside the government and outside the government, together to do a national climate assessment to, get that down to a regional level so that people can imagine what the future is going to be like. That'll come out uh, depending on whether the Congress decides to keep the government open. Uh, but will hopefully come out in the next month or so. so um, can I mention one more part super quickly? Sure. Uh, thank you for extending me some grace uh, on this. So one part of the climate resilience framework that we haven't explicitly mentioned, um, someone mentioned I think in passing, is CEDARS, the Community, De uh, Community Disaster Resilience Zones Act. Um, and I just wanna lift that up as a part of this as we think about where there are opportunities with all of this funding coming to these uh, currently designated areas across the country, um, looking at what are, how are we going to make sure that um, uh, local businesses and community-based organizations are going to be able to get part of the yeah. funding that goes into that because everything is going through the cities.
for, for all of that funding in the current structure and the current framing. Um, so it's gonna be critical um, for uh, those considerations as well as figure out ways to collaborate with philanthropy um, to see where there are opportunities to help bridge uh, some of those gaps if they exist. I'll give a concrete example and then I'm gonna stop. Um, so we have a, a, I can't give the details, but I'll, I'll give a high level example because I didn't ask for permission to tell their story. Um, so we do have a, one of our members is in a uh, urban environment. Um, their city um, is doing a ton of resilience strategies, planning, um, and some of the decisions that have been made are actually going to be harmful to that community. In fact, some of the decisions have already been harmful mm -hmm. to that community and caused increases in flooding just by virtue of the way highways were invested in and designed mm -hmm. in previous rounds of funding. So as we think about this, um, there are huge uh, uh, implications that we will not be able to recover from if we're not intentional now about how we coordinate with communities on the historical context of the infrastructure investments that have happened in the harm they've caused and how do we move forward in a way that will uh, address the previous harm but also ensure that there's no more future harm and that people are actually receiving um, the financial benefits on their return on investment in the country. I, I'm, re I'm really glad you raised that. Thank you, uh, Atina. And there's both uh, money in slightly different programs in the bipartisan infrastructure law and in the Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. uh, to take account of the way, uh, particularly in urban environments, infrastructure was built to reconnect communities and try to break down the barriers that were largely built up uh, around racial prejudice, et cetera. So, uh, but I think you're raising an uh, important and broader point about how we go about the overall uh, reaction to extreme weather. Um, Mayor, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> this has well, been a great conversation. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Podesta, and, and to everyone who organized today, and thank you all for bringing your stories and your experience here. Um, I, you know, I think that we're hearing some really important themes. Um, one, of course, is the importance of getting the funding down to the local level and right into the communities. And um, I think that we now, with the Biden administration, have multiple examples of the success of that approach. And so I really want to thank you and the rest of the administration for continuing to take that approach. I think we've also heard um, uh, both the availability and the continued need for technical assistance mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that we are sharing good ideas um, across uh, jurisdictions, but also across levels uh, of government. And so I think that's really uh, a thing that I know, I know the administration is committed to, but I just I think we have to keep pressing uh, on that front. And then uh, I think the other theme that I really heard was collaboration and the importance of, of collaborating across sectors. And so um, one thing that we haven't talked a lot about yet, and I just want to put on the table, is um, it, I think that the administration has the power, at least the power of the soapbox, to really try and get the private sector to the table on this. And um, I think a lot about the work that we do um, in my city on our built environment to be building lead buildings and to reduce our emissions and you know all of that. But um, I'm a fraction of the buildings <laughs> that happen. I mean, I, I have responsibility for a very small fraction of the buildings in the city of Madison. And, and so um, if we can get the private sector to take both mitigation and resilience seriously, and that will have a, 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 an effect across our communities, um, even if we just look at the, the uh, built environment. And so I think that, that that is a place that needs more attention. And there is funding, obviously, the, the, through the Inflation Reduction Act, it's available for the private sector. And um, I would love to see us come together and, and really bring all of the sectors in a place together to do this work. Thank you. That, that's a great uh, point to finish on. And of course, uh, the bulk of the money that's flowing through the Inflation Re uh, Reduction Act, I describe it as, um, as government enabled, but it's really private sector led. It's, th it's coming through the tax code. We've seen an enormous response in terms of investment, but that investment has to be smart investment. Yes. Uh, I think in the built sector, there's uh, drivers there uh, 
both at the uh, home-based and, and uh, through rebate programs and through the tax credits, but at, at the commercial space through reform of the, uh, and, and trying to move uh, both building codes forward, but also giving property owners the, the uh, ability to deduct improvements on efficiency uh, and build out of uh, renewable power, et cetera, batteries, et cetera. So thanks for raising that. and. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I think there's more to come, uh, but I'm at least, you know, what? what's the program after this? Or at least there's a reception. <laughs> yeah, there is a reception, so <laughs> I think make sure more. to plan to go to that. Um, so there are concurrent breakout sessions happening right now that are two-parters, so I would invite you to go down to the second floor, and there's basically sessions associated to each section of the framework. If you need the list of what those are and where to go, feel free to find me, but you should be able to catch the tail end of those if you're interested. Otherwise, there is a reception at 5.30 p.m. I believe it's at the National Academy of Science. Science. Yes, yeah. great. Um, and so if you didn't get a specific email for that, don't worry, you can still show up <laughs> and they will let you in. Um, as you can imagine, lots of invites were going out, but look forward to celebrating and talking to you all further there as well as just in the afternoon. And thanks again for coming. Great, thank you. Thank you.